This is Jocko Podcast number 311 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willing. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. June 6, 1944. D-Day. The largest seaborne invasion in history. Almost 7,000 ships and landing vessels, almost 200,000 naval personnel, and 150,000 ground troops attacking the heavily fortified beaches of the Nazis' Atlantic Wall in France. In doing so, Allied forces suffered over 10,000 casualties, including 4,414 killed in action. It was a brutal assault, but the beachhead was secured. However, the fighting was not over. Far from it. There was much fighting to be done. The fight through the Villers Bocage, the assault on the city of Cain in Cherbourg, the battle to seize the village of St. Lo, the fight to close the Falaise Gap, the liberation of Paris, the advance to the Rhine, Operation Market Garden in the Battle of Arnhem, Battles at Morburge, Overloon, the Hurtgen Forest, and all the way to the Battle of the Bulge in the Ardennes Forest. The Battle of the Bulge, the largest battle fought by Americans in World War II, December 1944 through January 1945, included a million Allied troops, 500,000 Americans. Resulted in more than 47,000 wounded, over 23,000 missing, and 19,000 killed in action. But in the Battle of the Bulge, once again, victory was achieved. And eventually, victory in Europe was achieved, and then Japan. And that victory was achieved by what is now known as the Greatest Generation. And it is an absolute honor for us tonight to have one of those men here with us, a man that landed on D-Day and fought all the way to the Battle of the Bulge. His name is Mr. Jake Larson, also known as Papa Jake. And he is here with us. Sir, thank you for coming. It is an honor to have you here. Well, it's an honor to be here. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I, I don't think I'm any spe- one special, but uh, of all the people I was with, and I started at a young age when I was 15. I joined the National Guard, and <clears throat> I I was in uh, Camp Claiborne, Louisiana. For, for, for nearly a year when the Japanese hit Pearl Harbor. <clears throat> so I go back a few few years. <laughs> and uh, as I look back, every person that I was with in three different units, Company F, 135th Infantry Regiment, Company H, or Headquarters Company, 135th Infantry Regiment, and... Fifth Corps, every person I was with is gone. <clears throat> Why I'm here now, maybe in a few days, I'm going to be 99 years old. <clears throat> 99 years, I can't believe it myself. Uh, I don't have aches and pains like other people have. No arthritis, no stiff thing. I I get up out of bed, I'm wide awake. It's crazy. I think my my life is governed from above, and I I thank those up there who who are doing this to me, who are sitting with me right now. 
I thank him for helping me. Well, sir, um, you said you, you said you don't think you're anything special, which I guess we could argue with that point, but I'm not here to argue with you, sir. However, you have to admit that you are lucky, and in fact, you did admit it. You have a book that you wrote, which is called The Luckiest Man in the World, and I think you're definitely in the, in the running for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I appreciate that, but uh, you, you, you have to read the book. I can't sit here and start telling you <laughs> how lucky I am, but, but uh, <clears throat> even before D-Day, uh, a month before D-Day, <laughs> if if anything was happening that had to do with exercises, uh, uh, I, I I attended uh, firing every kind of weapon because I came from the infantry. <clears throat> so uh, I was down to Land's End. They're shooting fifty caliber. Air, uh, water-cooled machine guns at towed targets, and uh, then that the, the British had this little exercise at Slapton Sands, and uh, they, they were going to greet us with live fire. Well, well, pretty interesting there. Uh, I, I was one chosen from G three. To go down there, a sergeant, and uh, I, I was with others fr from the landing. There was four hundred of us on this landing ship. And and this was, we'll get to that part of the story. But this, th what you're talking about, this exercise at Slapton Sands, yeah. this was just a prep preparatory <laughs> event to get ready for D Day. And yet, where you were doing this training, there was enemy there. There was enemy uh, enemy vessels. I, it, the, 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 there was two uh, e-boats, German e-boats came in there and sank two of those landing ship tanks right alongside of me and shot up the, the armed guard on top of, of the, the one I was in. And we had no air. We were... 400 of us laying there on the floor suffering from d diesel gas and uh, vomiting. Uh, uh, I don't know how we made it back to Plymouth, England, but when we got to Plymouth, a full bird colonel came out, called us to attention, and swore us to secrecy. We could not even discuss this with our superior officers when we got back. And this, I, I didn't know anything about this uh, or, or tell anyone about it for 40 years, 40 years the British brought it up. And uh, people started calling me a liar because uh, they said nothing like that ever happened. Well, I, I was there. I was there. It happened to me. And I, I found out that the f f 400 of, of those guys that had sank, there were 795 casualties there. 400 was, was from the 4th Infantry Division, which was supposed to land alongside of us on D-Day. It, it, it's un unbelievable to think of it now. No mention of these guys. They're all buried over in England, and they were put put on, on the record as being lost com coming to shore on D-Day. Uh, uh, crazy, mm. crazy. And that's one of the the many stories you have in this book, and and the book is 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 a phenomenal book. And I wanted to kind of go back in time a little bit and just talk about where you came from, and and read a little bit from the book. Um, and I'll I'll skip around so everyone that's out there, if you 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 have to get the whole book. I'm only going to read some little pieces of it today, 
but just wanted to talk to you about some of the things that you talk about in the book. Um, you say here, my birthday in, in December 1922 had a huge effect on my life because I was younger than most of my classmates who were born earlier in the year. All this meant, however, was that I learned how to get things done. Now, you grew up with seven seven brothers and sisters. Yes. You had Todd, Earl, Evan, Leo, Merle, Eleanor, and Bobby. Yeah. And you note in here, you say, I remember asking Leo how I was born. And he told me that a crow shit on a fence post and the sun hatched me out. Whenever I saw a crow, I wondered if it was the one responsible for my birth. Living on a farm, I saw plenty of chickens hatch, so the story made sense to me. <laughs> so I think uh, your brother Leo had you fooled for a little while. Well, well, he was 10 years older than me. And when, you, when you're five and somebody is, is uh, 15, <laughs> you, you look for somebody that... Uh, it's going to enlighten you. <laughs> Indeed. So you, your parents started off on a homestead in South Dakota, and you talk about that some in here, but then eventually um, Grandma Larson, who lived in Hope, Minnesota, wrote to my father and her husband's, after her husband's death, asking if he could move to Hope to run the farm. My parents packed their bags once again and moved to the 240-acre farm. Aunt Bertha got 80 acres, and we got the rest. The downstairs included the living room, along with pa and mother's bedrooms and the kitchen, which had a wood stove equipped with burners, an oven, and a 30-gallon reservoir. You say pa's bedroom was off the kitchen and mom's room was by the living room. They didn't sleep in the same bed, but managed to have eight kids anyways. <laughs> and then all the kids' rooms were upstairs. Yeah, yes, yeah. And you, you went through, I know we're uh, going through a pandemic right now, but you went through the... Or, or your parents began running the farm after the flu uh, pandemic of 1918. And that, that took my only living grandparent mm. at the time. It was my, my grandmother, uh, Grandmother Larson. Her husband, my grandfather, uh, died in his 40s. He came in. They said he came in from the barn complaining that he had a, a pain in his stomach, sharp pain, and they thought a horse kicked him in the stomach. And uh, I was a victim of appendicitis. My oldest brother was a bit, so it, it was appendicitis mm. that uh, killed him. It bro broke. And I, I, I went through that same thing. So... So well, growing up on the farm, uh, you say life on the farm was not easy. It was plain hard work. Every member of the family had chores. We'd get up at about 6 a.m., drink hot cocoa, then do chores, like milking cows, carrying feed for the cattle, cleaning the stalls, adding in the new straw, separating milk and cream. The milk went to the hogs, and the cream went to the house. We poured cream into cans, dropping them into the well to keep them cool. We milked 30 to 32 cows by hand every morning and night. I was about six years old when I started milking cows. Yeah, it, it's, a, it, it's a crazy life, but, but we didn't think anything about it. It, it, it. it was our life, and the neighbors were living the same way we were, so it, it was very, pretty natural. And uh, we didn't have a, a lot of extra money for good clothes, if our overhaul's got a hole in it from wear or, or from tear, my mother was an excellent seamstress and sewing machine oper operator. By hand, everything done with a pedal sewing machine. So, uh, so you had all that going on, plus you had turkeys, geese, Pigs, Everything. horses, ducks, and you planted wheat and corn and, and barley and oats and alfalfa and soybeans, tomatoes, potatoes, carrots, turnips. Everything. You had everything going on. <laughs> we, 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 we lived out of fruit jars. <laughs> that, 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 was a, that was the thing. We, we lived out of fruit jars, and uh, they, they, they were picking... Tom tomatoes when uh, my brother Bob climbed up on the windmill. And maybe it could 
Br- bring that up. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the one of the crazy accidents that you saw when you yeah. were growing up. Before we get to that, you had a section in here, and and the section, this chapter of the book is called Moonshine. <laughs> <laughs> and you say, Pa made moonshine long before I was born. He was accommodating people who needed to drink, but had to seek other means of getting it due to prohibition. I helped bottle the moonshine when I was eight. It was double pure, pretty close to 200%, but he used distilled water to cut it down to 85% alcohol. You tell a story in here about the first time you got drunk, which was around age five. (laughs) Coffee punch. (laughs) Yes. And it's funny, we're chuckling about it now, but you say in here at one point, it happened. One of dad's so-called friends turned him in and he got six months in Austin City Jail for selling moonshine, though the original sentence was up to two years at Leavenworth Penitentiary. So your dad ended up going into jail for a while. Six months, six months, celebrated their their 25th wedding anniversary in the Austin City Jail. And I remember uh, on the way down there, we, we had a, a Jewett car sedan. My brother Leo was driving. I, I, I was eight years old at that time. And uh, my brother Leo was driving. My mother did not drive, but she was alongside. And she had a, a cake, anniversary cake, to take along to, to my dad. And she said... Leo said, look, Ma, we're going a mile a minute now. Mm. Wow, that, that was moving 60 miles an hour. Man, what, what an advance from the horse buggy. That's amazing. Uh, you, you mentioned some of these accidents. You, know, you mentioned the windmill one, but... It's a whole sec. You you got a whole section in the book of when you're growing up, just called accidents. You had your sister get get injured by a manure spreader. You had a, a kid that got hit by lightning. Yeah. Um. You had one of your brothers hit you in the face with a piece of you know uh, they were getting a some kind of a rock dirt. fight. Yeah, yeah. A cloud of dirt. Uh. You guys were using dynamite when you were kids yeah. to yeah. blow stumps out of the ground. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, you talked about in here. So your your brother Bobby, uh, there's a windmill out by your house, about sixty feet tall. Exactly six, sixty foot. And there's a plank up forty five feet, and Bobby was up there, climbed up there. You're telling him to get down before mom comes home, and you know he says, "Oh, don't worry about it. I'll be down by the time she gets here." And he did. <laughs> well, one step again. It's. I guess it's. We're kind of chuckling about it now, but man, in the book here, let me let me read a little section from the book. They heard him fall, ran over, and brought him into the house, carrying him into the kitchen. His eyeballs were out of their sockets on his cheeks, and blood shot out of his ears whenever his heart beat. He was out cold. Leo ran to Uncle Charlie's house because he had a phone to call Doctor Ertle who put his eyeballs back into their sockets and cotton into his ears to slow the bleeding. The doctor said his broken right arm, splinting it with cardboard. I didn't think it could get any worse, but the fall cracked his head too. The doctor instructed us get ice packs on his head. Elmer Steele had an ice house about a mile from us, so we got the ice from there. Mom packed Bobby's ice head in ice, held on with cloth diapers. My mom tied him to the bed so he wouldn't move around feeding him soup and taking care of him. There's no nurse like a mother. He was her baby. For what seemed like a month, he lapsed in and out of consciousness until one day he sat up in bed asking, where's Jake? I want to play with Jake. And he was okay. Yeah. (laughs) He he lived till he was 75. He he caught every disease that was known to man. (laughs) And uh, I I, I worked right by him and and took, took baths. In the same tub, the wash tub, as he did, he had the measles. I never got them. I, I never had a childhood disease until I was 34 years old, and I got, got the mumps from my <laughs> son bringing them home from school. 
Uh, yeah, you, you got some incredible detail about that stuff in the book, too. Um, you ended up going to uh, grammar school. You went to, Le- what is it, Lemon Township? Lemon Township? Lemon. Lemon Township. You say you did homework by the kerosene lamplight. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And that's, you, you're talking about how that lamplight would get dirty. You have to clean it before you start your homework. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the wick would would cl- cloud the lamp gl- glass. That, that was clear glass, the lamp thing. No, that, that was, it was better than a candle. I guess the, the candles can only get so bright. Kerosene <laughs> yeah. lights can get pretty bright. Well, a, a lot b- brighter than <laughs> anything else. It's, uh, that, we we thought nothing of it. We, we thought it was a modern age at that time, <laughs> and uh, it, we we weren't the only ones. Everybody that uh, around, every farmer, and we were just far, farmers. Everybody lived the same way. They had to go through the same thing. That we weren't any different than anyone else. So if you're not any different, you don't know the difference. Mm-hmm. Now, now it sounds like when, for what was normal for you for you guys back then was when you got done with kind of grammar school when you got done with eighth grade sometimes you didn't you didn't continue on with school you didn't go to high school there was no such as anybody going to high school it was very unusual to, to, that someone would go to high school and and for you you had Mrs. Jeffrey who sent a note home that said I recommend that you let Jake go to high school because he's a fast learner. That, that's it. Yeah. Oh, do I remember that? It's like yesterday. And how'd your dad react to that? Uh, my dad says, there's no <laughs> high school for you. You've got chores to do. you got chores to do. So, uh, and eventually, it was your brother Earl that who, said... Who was 14 years older than me, Earl wow. was. And he was a horseman. We had 30 horses at that time. There, there was no thing as tractors or anything. Everything was done by horse-drawn machinery. And Earl was uh, took care of the horses and sh- shoot them and the doctoring on them and broke them from wild horses to uh, working in the harness. And he ended up telling your dad that he would help with the work so that you would be able to go to school. Yeah, he, he would do my chores for me if, if I got, got a chance to go to school. Yes. And, and he did. And I, I, I dedicated part of this book to Earl because I would not be here today if he hadn't done my chores. Then the high school that you went to, you had to go and live somewhere else, right? Uh, yeah, 14 miles away, yeah, and, and the, the roads are not open in the wintertime there. It was all done with horses and sleighs, so you, you, you can't go 14 miles every, every day, morning and night, <laughs> in a sleigh, so you, you had, to, had to stay in town with someone. And then you ended up, in order to pay for your room and board, you ended up Pretty much working for one of your friend's moms who had a had a little place to stay, and you helped out there. Oh. <laughs> one of my lucky breaks again. <laughs> I um, couldn't couldn't go out for any sports because <clears throat> I had to run home at noon and put those the, the meals on the table. We had eight room and boarders that I helped take care of. <clears throat> And uh, I, I started high school when I was 12 years old. Uh, I graduated eighth grade at 12, and uh, being born in December, I'm, I'm still 12 when I start high school in September. And uh, it, it, it's crazy people say, well, whoa. But, but uh, when you tell people, you're, you're born in 1922, I didn't say, I tell them that I only had 11 days in 1922. <laughs> you know, I was born on December 20th. 
So, so I was only 11 days old in 1922. They, they, they called it a full year, see, <laughs> mentally. Uh, so I got to go to the book here, this, this section here, because it kind of starts off your military career. It says, in 1938, I was walking around town on a Saturday afternoon with my cousin Chick. Outside Roxy Theater, we saw a sign, Saturday matinee, Gene Autry, America's number one cowboy. It cost 10 cents, but we didn't have a penny between us. Chick suggested, Jake, let's join the National Guard. They pay $12 every three months. It sounded like a great way to ensure a steady income, but I pointed out, Chick, we're 15. You have to be 18. Chick was a lot taller and heavier set than me. We were like Mutt and Jeff. He answered, when they ask how old we are, just say 18. The worst they can do is kick us out. They aren't going to arrest us. So we walked into the office at the armory, and I still remember the stocky captain's name, Captain Hugh H. Soper. He looked looked up from his desk asking, what can I do for you? Sir, we'd like to join the National Guard. I was expecting him to ask how old we were, and I was ready to say 18. He looked me in the eyes and asked, what year were you born? Wow, I had to think quick. 1922, 1923, 1919, sir. Chick had it easy since he was just standing behind me. He just followed suit and answered the same thing. So Soper stamped out our enlistment papers and we were in. It was as easy as that, no physical or test required. I joined Company F, 135th Infantry Regiment of the 34th Infantry Division, the Red Bulls. So you're 15 years old. 15 years old. Were you? Did you look young? <clears throat> and uh, no, no. Uh, f- farmers looked rough. Okay, so uh, you looked a little bit older. We we looked older. <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, uh, at that time, the National Guard. Uh, this is when Hitler was taking the Sudetenland, and had just annexed Austria in 1938. So. Uh, uh, our, our our country was strictly against war, strictly against war. They didn't they didn't want anything to do with go, going to Europe and messing up with with Hitler. Hitler was uh, was uh, pretty well known. He he wasn't known at that time of all the killings and labor. Camps that he had were forced labor. That all came out later, and when stuff like that comes out, it's like it is right now. It is hard to believe that a person can be that way. So, uh, the, the National Guard was trying to fill its units that, to get up to full strength so that in case of war, they had the strength in national. The, the army was only about uh, 150,000 strong at that time. Army, the whole army in the United States was 150,000. And uh, th- th- that's when uh, President Roosevelt put, put 28 or 29 National Guard units into federal service. That that was uh, February tenth, nineteen forty-one. I I had just turned eighteen in, in uh, December twentieth, nineteen forty, and uh, we're put in the federal service and shipped down to Camp Claiborne, Louisiana. So. Uh, <laughs> My, my God, I had nearly a year, and there went went through the Louisiana maneuvers, uh, belly up, belly down, in chigger-infested <laughs> land, po- poisonous snakes, and uh, uh, it, it, uh, w- w- what a place. It was a hellhole. You say in here, I learned as much about training for war combat as I did about coping with chiggers, ticks, and intense humidity. <laughs> oh, God, it, it was terrible. It was terrible. And so that you left for that February 1941, mm-hmm. and so we still weren't at war yet. No. But you, but it, 
the, the country look like we were heading in that direction. I know you, you mentioned in here one of your friends, Carlos. Carlos Boki. Yeah, Carlos Boki. He told me, Jake, let's join the Air Force. I asked him why, and he said the money is better and we'll get to be officers. I thought that sounded good. At the time, I was a corporal getting $42 a month while a private earned $30 a month. Carlos and I decided to try and enlist, so we went through the physicals and written tests. The physicals involved an eye exam. Carlos passed his, but they told me I was colorblind. I had no idea. Then I found out my brother Todd was also colorblind. So you tried to join the Air Force, but you you, you couldn't see colors. They wouldn't let you in, so you stayed in the Army. So I stayed in the Army, and I'm here today. There's another thing, the luckiest man in the world. I turned out to be colorblind, but the, the Army didn't know that. I had never had a physical for colorblindness, and the Air Corps didn't tell them that I was colorblind, but it's an interesting thing there. If you want me to relate on Carlos Boki, I will tell you that I am lucky probably that I didn't join the get into the aviation. Carlos Boki died on his graduation day in a flyby. Two planes collided and burned. They don't even know which body they shipped back to bury. Here I am. He was 19 years old at the time. Here, here I am, go, going on 99 with a family, a family, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Can, can you question why I say I'm the luckiest man in the world? No questions from my side of the table, sir. Um, you so Pearl Har- Pearl Harbor happens December seventh, nineteen forty one. Um, I I kind of wanted to portray a little bit of your uh, let's say let's say your rebellious spirit. You had a little rebellious <laughs> spirit when you were younger. Um, Colonel Schmidt, the hundred thirty fifth Infantry Commanding Officer, announced that all the company clerks he had authority over were authorized fifteen day furlough. So you were going to get fifteen days of leave. Now Captain Erickson, Erickson, told you, "Hey, get everyone set. Only give people seven days." And you told him, "Sir, everyone will have to turn around and come home before they even get there." And he said, "Corporal, I'm your commanding officer. You will do as you are told." Exactly. And so. You do what you're told, except for on your papers, you give yourself 15 days of leave so you can get back home, spend some time, then come back. And he just went through the stack of papers and signed them all, and you took your 15 days. (laughs) That that changed my life. Captain Erickson was killed in the North Africa invasion. The 34th Division went down to North Africa at Morocco or Algeria there, and uh, and he was killed down there. And the company clerk is close to your captain. So, uh, <laughs> and in the meantime, I got transferred into F- Fifth Corps. <laughs> right. He, 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 he was trying to punish you by getting He was you, trying to punish me. Moving uh, you away from him. I was going to be... T- or climbing poles and stringing wires, according to Captain Erickson. Um, but then you ended up, you ended up going into the the G three into operations. I, I was the only operations sergeant there. <clears throat> now is that because you knew how to type? That's because I, I, I was an expert typer. Where did you learn how to type? I, I, I had one year of typing in high school <laughs> so as an <laughs> elective. Yeah, I, I was the only boy in a class of 30. It ended had, up being an extremely important skill for your whole it, life. It changed my life. Being able to type. Uh, you say here, 
being part of the G3. So G3, for people that don't know, this is operations. These are people that are coming up with the plans and, and, and directing how these operations are gonna go. And, and you say here, man, being a part of G3 was a whole different world. Instead of reporting to a captain or a lieutenant, I had to report to a full bird colonel or a lieutenant colonel. You said, once I was part of G3, I met, I met who would become one of my closest friends while in the service, Corporal Madison Rich. He was from New Jersey and was a skilled typist just like myself. You said, when I had free time, I, this is, by the way, this is when you're, I, I fast forward past this part, but this is when you're overseas. You're now in Ireland and England, and you're, you guys are preparing for the invasion. You say, when I had free time, I'd hang out with my other pals, Corporal Cray and Staff Sergeant Robbie, Robert Jeffrey. Cray was the cockiest Irishman I ever met while Jeffrey was subdued. I was only 19 at the time, and they were both much older than me. Because of my slight stature, they nicknamed me Bony Ass. <laughs> well, I was five foot 10, weighed 120 pounds, so uh, I... Uh, the luckiest man in the world. When I landed on D-Day, we were under a lot of fire. I had two of those uh, MG-42 machine guns shooting at me, Oof. and they, they only shoot 1,200 rounds a minute, each one. So, so, so you're, when you double it, it's quite a thing. But... Uh, the Germans were not used to shooting that toothpick, so uh, <laughs> I, I made it through. Uh, before you get to D-Day, you, you have one incident that I just, I had to bring up because um, it, it and is another thing that had a big impact on your life. You, you were taking some pictures and there was a major that you were with. Major and, Ridgeway. And you say, he had gotten out of his Jeep while he was talking to me so I sat down in the Jeep and handed him my 35 millimeter Argus camera. Here, Major, can you take a picture of me sitting in your Jeep? What's funny about the picture is that it was the only Jeep I ever sat in while I was in the service. I sent that picture along with other pictures to my mother. My dad looked through them and picked the picture of me sitting in the Jeep to bring to the photo, photo news. They liked it well enough to put in their paper, adding a blurb about Corporal Jake Larson in North Ireland. I was unaware of it at the time, but that picture being published in the paper would lead me to the love of my life, and we'll we'll get to that later. Um, at this point, now you guys are, and again, I'm gonna fast forward a little bit, but now you leave to go to Portsmouth to start the planning for Portsmouth. D-Day. Portsmouth, okay, I'll, I'll say it that way. So you guys go to Portsmouth to uh, start the planning. You're promoted to sergeant, and and this is where you you participate in that operation or the training operation at Slapton Sands, which you talked about earlier. Just an unbelievable travesty. You go on this training mission. These, these, these ships are filled with soldiers to practice D-Day, and the Germans actually sank some of those ships, two of those ships. 795 people killed before D-Day even happened during a training operation? One month before D-Day. <clears throat> and they, the Americans that died during that, they reported, they told the, the families that they died during D-Day. Absolutely, yeah. And that brings us to D-Day. And I just wanna read some of this and, and just get your feedback on it. Um, D-Day was supposed to be June 5th, so all the troops were loaded into ships the day before, including me. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they called it off and we had to return. They had a British weather master who told Eisenhower there would be a break in the weather in the morning, so he decided to have the invasion go on June 6th. By the time of the change, I hadn't slept for 72 hours, just running on adrenaline. There are 7,000 ships on the move with 158,000 troops and our destination about 170 miles away. Everywhere you looked, there was a ship and they were going to different beaches. Everything was programmed. I went in with the members of the 1st Infantry Division on the USS Ancon. 
which was the command ship. About eight miles from shore, the landing craft pulled up alongside us, so we had to climb down rope ladders into the boat carrying 75 pounds of gear and our rifles. Then we dropped into the landing craft, which was bobbing up and down in three to four foot waves. You know, we see images uh, produced by computers to simulate what it looked like with all those ships on D-Day. That must have been an incredible sight. That's the most unbelievable thing. It's it's even hard to describe. How do you describe that? Every, every place you look, there's a ship. And behind it, another ship. And behind that, more ships, more ships, more ships. How do you crowd 7,000 ships in, into a small area like that there? Uh, and uh, I, I'm on the ANCON. That's, that's where Eisenhower was on. <clears throat> the commander. Mm-hmm. The, the, the little farm boy from Hope, <laughs> Minnesota. The, 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 only graduated high school. And uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a, a sergeant, man. I worked on the invasion with Colonel Hill. I got the Bronze Star for for, for what I did, worked on. I, I didn't even know I was going to get it. But uh, it, it's, it's crazy. Did you guys, since you were part of the planning, you must have had very good awareness of what you were going into in terms of the oh, enemy oh, positions. Oh, oh yes. It yeah. seems like you would have known even more what you were facing than the normal soldiers who maybe weren't as involved in the planning. I, 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 I was not a normal soldier at that time. I was the highest classified person you can get. I was top secret bigot, B-I-G-O-T. Most people don't even know what bigot is, but that's the highest rating you can get. Think of it, little farm boy from Hope, Minnesota. When when I told people that uh, afterwards that uh, I was classified top secret bigot, yeah, what what's that? You know, it didn't mean anything to them. And this was your first combat operation was uh, D-Day. Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> it was the first for the, for all of our troops. Mm-hmm. What was the what was the fear level for uh, there, you? There was no fear level. We wanted to, uh, uh, we, we'd been over to England the, the, then for, for t- two and a half years. Uh, we, we'd been over there planning this thing and uh, we wanted to get it done. Get, get it done. They kept putting it off and putting it off. And finally, when yeah, we got to go, it, the weather wasn't very good. But but uh, in the long run, the weather kind of helped us. Uh, it took the Germans off guard. Uh, even Rommel, who was uh, guarding that part, went home to celebrate his wife's birthday. Uh, you say here, I was the last off, last one off the ship when they dumped us out too far. We marched off the ramp into the water and all walked in a line. I made my way into the icy water that reached up to my chin, holding my rifle over my head, but I wasn't thinking about the water's temperature. I just wanted to get through it alive. The section of shore I landed on was known as Easy Red. We were supposed to be able to walk through the surf and find bomb holes, which would be shelters for us. The Air Corps totally missed Omaha Beach, so there was no protection for us. Those beaches were all mined. I would find out later in life that there were millions of mines on that beach. If you stepped on one of those babies, it was a quick trip to heaven. I was more afraid of stepping on a mine than being shot at. I ran toward the cliffs, making sure to step in the same footprints as the man in front of me made. What in the hell am I doing here? The thought pounded in my head as I dodged bullets, determined to stay focused on reaching the safety of the cliffs. How did a simple farm boy from Minnesota land on Omaha Beach on D-Day? 
Machine guns were firing in all directions with bodies everywhere. Those MG42 machine guns shot 1,200 to 1,500 rounds per minute. I ran and dodged, finally making my way to a sand berm. The bullets were blasting off the berm as I ducked into it. I wasn't going to get out of that hole no matter what. I smoked at that time, and I had my cigarettes in this plastic bag so they wouldn't get wet. Unfortunately, I didn't have a match. I remember then that I started shaking. Before that moment, I had felt no fear. I turned to my left and left and saw a soldier lying down with his back toward me. I called out, hey buddy, do you have a match? Then I noticed there was no head underneath the helmet. That got me moving. Jake, move, I told myself. I got up and dashed for the bottom of the cliff wall about 200 yards away. I remember saying to myself, Jake, what the hell are you doing here? You're running for your life so nobody can shoot at you, but everybody can shoot at you. I only weighed 120 pounds soaking wet, so that was an advantage since it's hard to shoot at a toothpick. After what seemed like an eternity, I made it to the cliff wall where I was safe. From what I've read, over 2,500 de- died at Omaha Beach that day. That, that was on Easy Red, to work where I went in on. That's where. <laughs> and if I look back, I, I went back to uh, Omaha Beach on the 75th anniversary of D Day. <clears throat> And uh, I had f- f- five d- d- different uh, t- TV stations, BBC, France 1, France 2, CBS, NBC, w- waiting at the cemetery of an Omaha Beach cemetery. I have never been in a military cemetery at the time and they said we we want you to walk out there and look at one of the tombstones and uh, stand there while we take pictures I walked out there I came I told you I came in with the with part of the first division the 16th infantry regiment and the first tombstone I, I landed, uh, l- looked at, said, here this, this pri- private from the 16th Infantry Regiment was buried there. Uh, I, I, I'm standing there with my hat on and coat. I, I didn't know that, you don't salute as a thing. So I raised my right hand with my hat above my head. Th- that that picture went viral all, all over the world. It's like the, the ghosts of those guys buried there that day were down there watching me. And when I raised my hat in a salute to them, it was like a response that I got from the guys. After all, I'm not the hero. Those guys that are buried there are the heroes. I made it through because they put their life up for me. I keep telling people, I am not the hero. Uh, I'm a here too, I told you. Yeah, I, I changed from hero to here too. They said, what is a here too? I said, I'm here to tell you the story of, of my life. And it's unbelievable, but uh, I, I'm here because of that. And that's what's got me through life. So when you got to the cliff and now you're you're so you're i guess you're a little bit out of the enemy fire is there still enemy uh, fire uh, coming they can't fire down underneath themselves got it 
but you still have to push through barbed wire and uh, the guys uh, yeah. start getting out the Bangalore torpedoes, right? Yeah, and that, that, that was a dangerous one because uh, the guy that shoved those Bangalore torpedoes up, two of them were killed right there. But, but as quick as they went off and we started to going up above and got behind the Germans, they, they have no protection. They cleared out fast. So it didn't take long. And then we got to set up. I have periods of total blankness, and this is one of them. The next thing I knew, we had set up the command post. I don't even remember setting it up. And uh, I was digging a foxhole with Corporal Rich. And that's a kind of an interesting thing, too. If you <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, you're setting up this command post. You don't remember a lot of it, and and you say, um, <clears throat> "I was relieved to see my good friend Corporal Madison Rich, who arrived in a different landing craft than I." That right there must have been amazing to yeah. see all these guys get killed, and you happen to one of your other friends from a different landing craft happens to make it. Yeah, he stayed in the foxhole next to mine. And I had my litter down in my foxhole. A litter was just a canvas cloth fastened between two removable sticks on either side. I slept on top of it to keep moisture and dampness off my body. We didn't have sleeping bags. We made our own with wool blankets provided, calling them fart sacks. Which, by the way, we still called sleeping bags fart sacks in the military when I was in. Uh, Once I found out I had to work that night, I told Corporal Rich, you can sleep in my foxhole tonight. I've got the litter in there. Thanks, Jake. I I got my fart sack all made up now. I'm not changing it. Nevertheless, he laid his M1 rifle on my litter and went to sleep. That night, the Germans wanted to see what we were up to, so they sent over reconnaissance planes, dropping flares to take pictures after midnight. They lit up the beach like daylight. Our anti-aircraft started shooting up at those planes. Well, what goes up must come down, so when Matty Rich got up in the morning, he went to pick up his rifle in my foxhole, only for it to fall in two pieces. The shrapnel from our men shooting at the Germans had hit his rifle during the night. Talk about luck. They had called on me to work that night, and he's fortunate he didn't take me up on my offer of sleeping there. So there you go. It seems like it's a story of my life (laughs) to be in the right place at the right time. Yeah, so we're in your bed where you were going to sleep that night, the rifle that was sitting on your bed it, it, it was, was snapped on my, in half. It, 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 it fell in two, yeah. Um, and if you ever saw, saw M1 Garand, that's a pretty hefty uh, yeah. gun. <laughs> pretty hefty rifle. It uh, weighs eight pounds. So... Uh, it had to take some kind of a direct hit to to be able to fall in two. And during this time, you're supposed to be working during the day and then getting some sleep at night. But what's happening for these first five, six, seven days, you're working during the day, and then at night you all have to move. Yep. So you're not getting any sleep at well, all. Well, uh, that, that, uh, I <laughs> the action all st- took place during the day. <clears throat> Uh, uh, very little action during the night. <clears throat> so uh, w- when I'd try to sleep d- during the day, uh, th- the Germans would shell us. Mm. I was right at St. Saint- Lowe then was uh, the place we were trying to capture. And they told us it was going to take a few days to capture. T- took us a month. <sighs> T- took took us a month. The G- Germans don't like like to give up, and uh, they, they are great fighters. Man, we had our hands full. But uh, we we um, covered a book on this podcast called "The Clay Pigeons of Saint Lowe by Glover Johns, who was one of the officers that that fought there. And uh, and so you were there for that. You say about a month after D Day, we were supposed to capture a little town called Saint Lowe. We moved from the cliffs to the hedgerows of the town. We planned to capture it without delay, but it took us about a month because the Germans put up such stiff resistance. 
We put out orders and then different units under our command carried them out. At that time, other infantry units had landed on D-Day with us and those troops were under our control. We would storm them or open fire. Civilians didn't count. They didn't factor into the equation. You have to take that position in war. If they're in the way or on the road, you just rush them off. That's why so many civilians were killed during the war. We tore the hell out of St. Lo. I spent most of my time during the daylight thinking of getting some sleep, but again, we were always on the move. We were captured, after we captured St. Lo, I went to bed in the morning and woke up at 2 a.m. unable to remember how I got there. I had been numb, thinking only of sleep, sleep, sleep. Each soldier, each soldier carries a tent shell, half tent shell, so I put my shelter half in a ditch and there was three feet high next to the road. If you don't have another soldier with you, you have to make do with you half a tent. I was thinking about brushing my teeth and shaving. I noticed another soldier walking around carrying something. I took the liner out of my helmet and poured some water into it so I could brush my teeth and was just about to shave when one of the soldiers asked, hey, what the hell are you doing here? I explained, I'm going to shave. I work at night. I just woke up. He said, this is supposed to be all clear. There's a 155 meter, uh, shell, millimeter shell mm. laying on the road and we're sandbagging it to detonate it. So there you were going to brush your teeth and there's a <laughs> unexploded shell. You happen to run into these guys. Not, not, any close, clo- not any farther away than you and I sitting right now. I don't think, if that thing went off, I don't think even the luck would get you through that one. No, no. <laughs> not the but 155. But it didn't. My luck held out. Your luck held. Uh, here's another one. and then another, another piece of evidence for the luckiest man in the world. Colonel Hill asked me what I was doing. I said I was thinking about getting something to eat. He said, I got a Jeep coming up from the motor pool, and I'll t- I'll t- I'd like to you to ride along with it to look at our next command post, to check it out. For Colonel Hill, I would do anything. The guy saved my, saved my life a few times by putting me in charge of the night shift. I responded, gladly, sir. We had a hand-drawn map of the area. A private drove the Jeep as I looked at the map. Suddenly, I realized we missed the turnoff. So I said to the private, I think we missed the turnoff. It was, there was a ditch there. The culvert indicated the road's entrance. So, just as he got the Jeep turned around, Another Jeep turned down that road, hit a landmine, and blew up. That was the place we were supposed to turn. Somebody was looking out for me, I swear. I went, we went back to Colonel Hill reporting the incident. He uttered, you're like a cat with nine lives. <sighs> yeah. You're using up some of those nine lives in these events. Didn't get a scratch. <laughs> D- didn't get a scratch. Uh, look, I came up to uh, the, the whole Battle of the Bulge, and I was one of, I was one of the first ones after the Battle of the Bulge. Think of it. I, I'm one of the first ones to get leave to come home before the war is over. Forty-five days. Uh, un- unbelievable lucky. But I, I had a, 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 it was on the point system. Right. And uh, I had 127 points. And you were at the top of the list. I was at the top of the list. Because the points were based on how long you've been you there. been in the service and how long overseas. And, yeah. Man. Yeah. And before you even get to the Battle of the Bulge, shortly after that, we moved through a narrow valley called the Falaise Gap. Falaise. Falaise Gap where we had a German army partially trapped. The English came in from the west while we came in from the southeast. Part of Patton's troops was there, yep. plus the five corps. We captured 50,000 German soldiers and killed nearly that many. We bombarded them from three sides. When we got there, the shooting was over. That's the first time I ever walked over dead people and around dead horses. When we landed on Omaha Beach, I had never stepped over any of our soldiers. Soldiers, that's like stepping on your brother. I didn't get the same feeling walking over the enemy. What was the what was the um, what was the feeling about Patton? Did you guys all know who he, was he? As legendary back then for you guys. Well, 
pa pa Patton, first, first Army was the one that uh, landed on D-Day. First Army and, and uh, Fifth Corps and Seventh Corps were, were the two corps under First Army. Now, Fifth Corps had Omaha Beach, all of Omaha Beach. I was the only operations sergeant in in uh, Fifth Corps, G3. So uh, th th think about this this little farm boy from Hope, Minnesota, uh, a mi minuscule place, 100 occupants there, uh, uh, farmers was in charge of that every night. Think of that. How, how is that possible? Because Earl volunteered to do my chores for me, and I got a, I, I took typing one, one year. <laughs> I, I, it's crazy when you look back at it. it it's, it's plain crazy. I, 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 it's hard for the, me to understand how this uh, it, It's hard for me to be here. I'm going to be turning 99. I, I cannot believe that I am here. I'm, I'm the only one left of all the people I was in the service with. There's nobody else that I was in with alive. And sitting here, going to be 99, without an ache or a pain in my body, how is that possible? There's got to be an answer somehow. And uh, I say, there is a God. That's my favorite saying, <laughs> there is a God. And he certainly looks out for you, that's for he's, sure. He's been taking care of me great. Uh, the next thing that you did was the capture of Paris, or the liberation of Paris. What was that like? Uh, uh, the, 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 there was another thing. The, the free French, when we came in, the, the, the Germans had gave, gave up. The generals had called it off. He, he wasn't fight back. But the free French came in there, and while the Germans were evacuating, they, they came in there and threw those... Uh, Molotov co cocktails yeah. into their trucks and everything. I, 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 but uh, if you'd have been treated like the French were treated for four years, I, I have a different view, see, where I'm coming in. I, I, I wasn't uh, subjected to any of the Germans or anything. We were there just, just to fight them. So... Uh, it was kind of hard for me to realize that th these people suffered, suffered. There were thousands and thousands of them who were drafted and, and put into uh, the army with the, with the Germans. Uh, it, it, being an American and... and uh, with the liberties that we have, it's hard to uh, transform your opinions when you're being killed and shot at and uh, abused. I, I I just don't know how to put it. Mm. And and you as a farm boy from Hope. Minnesota ended up having a pretty nice office once you got yeah, in General <laughs> Pat Marshal Patton's office. How how did things like this happen? <laughs> it, 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 it's crazy. So so Marshal Patton was the was the guy in charge of the the the, the Vichy French. Yeah, the Vichy. The Vichy, the Vichy French. He he, 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 he was uh, the one that led the French through the First World War. Right. And uh, I sat at his desk, <laughs> and it was loaded with m medals of all kinds. Uh, 
Now, uh, I, the French gave me the Legion of Honor. In uh, 19, uh, 2014, they, they announced that I, I would have the Legion of Honor, and in 2015, February, we went to uh, San Francisco to the French, French, uh, where their officials were, and uh, there was ten of us hmm. that that sat there, and we were each presented with the Legion of Honor. That, that, b besides the Legion of Honor, I was the only one t to receive. The, the, the French retired soldier badge. Uh, I'm an honorary French retired soldier. That's that little red, white, and blue one right there. Um, it's it's one of the. I'm proud of that. Beyond yeah, being proud, I'm pr mo mostly proud to be American. B but uh, the French recognized that, that I had been working for them and uh, g gave me that along with the Legion of Honor. Uh, I, I don't know of any other soldier in the American Army that has received that honorary retired fr French soldier. That's that's definitely an honor, um, and at, even as you know, you say the the Germans kind of gave up Paris, but it wasn't yeah. over yet. Yeah, and and you had even more close calls. You you say this here as after we moved out moved out of Paris, we ended up in Luxembourg. Since I worked nights, after ah. I'd get some rest during the day, I'd have some free time to walk on the cobblestone streets. We were in a valley, and I came to an intersection at the foot of a hill. I had just started crossing the road when an English Spitfire and a German Messerschmitt right on its tail shot over the hill, the Messerschmitt firing its cannon at the Spitfire. When they came down the hill, the cannon shot right in front of me, shattering the cobblestones into pieces. I landed on my face in the cobblestones and got the hell out of there. Once again, it was unbelievable how lucky I was. <laughs> I, 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 I say this: close only counts in horseshoe and grenades. <laughs> oh. uh, you mentioned the Battle of the Bulge earlier on, Dece on December sixteenth at two in the morning. I was on duty when a corporal drove up to the command post, came in, and reported. He was so excited that he saluted me, a staff sergeant. He declared, "I'm at guard post number six. And of course, we got out the operations map so I could see right where he was, just south of Monshaw. Monshu? Monshaw. He told me that the German paratroopers were coming down. I asked, when, when you saw them coming down, what did you do? I got in the Jeep and came right here. So that was the beginning of the Battle of the Bulge. That Bulls. was the beginning. And the, uh, the Germans put, had, had POWs, American POWs, took their uniforms and then went out into this area and started changing the road signs and doing, they were spying and stuff. And you talked about the fact that if you caught those people, when those people were caught, they were shot. No trials necessary for those men. They were, since they were killed on the spot. Killed on the spot. And then the German tanks started to roll through. Um, now, Melbourne, they, they, they line, lined up all these guys that were uh, artillery observers. They caught, I think, 180 80 of our, our guys were, were caught there and lined up in the ditch with their hands over their head. And, and it was snowing at the time when uh, the German tanks rolled by and... Uh, Colonel Pfeiffer, uh, uh, of the, who led the Germans at that time, ordered those tanks 
to fire their machine guns at these guys in the ditch. That, that's called the Malmody Massacre. Now, did you hear, how long did it take for you to hear about that? Oh, about an hour. <sighs> about an hour. That word got back fast. We were, we were cut off from the First Army when they went through there. And uh, we, we, we ended up being part of General Montgomery's 21st Army Group and uh, talk about luck. Patton was, they ordered to get help from Patton from the 3rd Army. That was a long ways away. But, but by the time Patton got there, Montgomery, we, we were a part of Montgomery's Twenty hmm. First Army Group. Think that, 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 that we, we're the Fifth Corps was the only one that was part of Patton's Patton's Twenty First Army, and uh, we had the First and Twenty Ninth, I think, or Twenty Ninth or Twenty Eighth Division. Either one, one of those others at the time. Uh, it just slipped my my mind. Uh, that my mind is pr pr pretty full of stuff, <laughs> but uh, I, I can't tell you for sure which one. But, but anyway, we we put the squeeze on the Germans from two sides. Mm -hmm. They had nowhere to go except drop their weapons and march out. <clears throat> and they ran out of fuel too. And in they, their oh, tanks. Well, they they left all their vehicles right there. They. They walked out. I was reading some history about this, and I guess six different occasions. This was this was Hitler's plan was to push into you know to push push yeah, and split, Antwerp. Yep, to push through there, and six times his generals objected to the plan and said this isn't a good idea. We shouldn't do this, and six times he said no. We're doing it anyways. Not listening. He was not listening to his <laughs> his his subordinates as they yeah, tried to push back. Did he ever? No. <laughs> he he just fired them. Yeah. <laughs> so, so as they pushed back, and that that battle, the Battle of the Bulge, lasted almost a month and a half, something like that. Well, well I got out of there December thirty first. Okay. That's when I got forty five days leave. It. it uh, I'll, I'll tell you the story of that. Uh, December 31st, the cr Colonel Hill called me in and said, uh, I, I, I got a, a furlough for you. You're, you're, you're going to go home for 45 days. And uh, so, oh my God, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I, I, I had... Rifles and stuff under Colonel Hill's bed. He had this truck that uh, his bed and everything was in that. And uh, it was a good place to store stuff, so he didn't <laughs> mind sleeping over it. But I, I left that stuff over there when, when uh, I was going just on furlough, see? I thought I'd be back to... Uh, Pick that up. So uh, it, it took me 51 days <laughs> to get home. And uh, and part of that was transporting wounded, right? Oh, you yeah. ended up oh, on a uh, ship. And from La Havre, yeah, from, from La Havre to, to Portsmouth. I, I think two or three shiploads of wounded so you as you tried to leave there's like we mentioned like i mentioned earlier there was 47,000 wounded <laughs> during the battle of the bulge so instead of the ships being able to take people home on furlough you ended up on these ships getting people transported where back to england to, to yeah to, to to portsmouth england portsmouth england 
that's where we'd stop and unload the ships again and then go back and get another load, see. And here I'm supposed to be headed across the Atlantic. And, uh, but, but think of this. When I do get home, when I do get home and spend my 45 days at home, I go up to Fort Snelling and a captain call, calls me in. He says, Sergeant, 10 minutes, 10 minutes ago, I got a call from the Pentagon and they told me that I, they, they, they let me, I could stay home or go back to Germany. My God, after three years over there, <laughs> There's no way I'm going back to Germany. <laughs> so all, all all the relics that I had under Colonel Hill's bed, they were given up. Don't know what happened, and I don't miss one of them. <laughs> so that that's uh, as you as you get home, I can't even imagine going from that many months of direct combat and just getting on a ship, getting back to America. What was it like when you got home, especially before you found out that you were gonna get to stay home? Oh, hey, 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 hey. My, my, my mother was dying from a heart disease called leakage of the heart. It was a valve in there. And uh, I, I never thought I'd see her anymore but she was still living and she lived for five years after that she saw her grandchildren two of her grandchildren at that time and uh, I, I say there is a God but, but two weeks after my mother passed away Dr. Hoffnagel in Washington, D.C., invented the valve that would have cured her. But uh, you can't turn back time. It's, it's, it's like crying over spilt milk, see. You can't pick it up. It's done. <sighs> um, so... Was there anything else about the war when, when you were there, like on a day-to-day -day basis? How did, you, how did you handle that? How did you face, you know, you said when you were going to D-Day, you weren't really afraid. <laughs> then once you were getting shot at behind this bird. I, 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 I asked, what the hell am I doing here? You, right. I, you, if you're in that position, you want to be able to fight back. Mm -hmm. Well, well, there's no way you can fight back there. They're, they're protected from fire, and, and you have to know exactly where they are, what little hole they're shooting out of. <clears throat> and it's pretty hard to determine when you're running for your life and uh, dodging. It's, it's a circumstance you don't ever want to be in. But uh, you're not the only one. <laughs> Mind you, you you got all the guys around you that are doing the same thing, and some of them being shot, and that'll spur you on a little bit too. <laughs> when somebody gets shot, <clears throat> puts a little bit umpus in you. But yeah. So when when you get back. Um, and now you find out that that you that they're going to discharge you. You're done with the army. You're done with the army. Uh, you say that here. You say I was done. That was April thirteenth, nineteen forty-five, and the war ended in May. I was just twenty-two years old with seven years of soldiering under my belt. It's crazy when you think about that. So that's it. The war's over for you. And now it's uh. You start off by going back to farm life, right? Yeah, 
I've started helping my dad by rebuilding the, the hog shed, cementing and everything. And, and then uh, I, I started to think, uh, I, I'm gonna have to have some kind of occupation. They don't like, the, uh, they, they don't care about uh, hiring somebody for just shooting people, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, I in, enrolled in Dunwoody Institute. Uh, it, uh, I, I took t training in electricity. Uh, in radio, TV, I anything that had to do with le electricity, I, I, I did. And uh, in fact, after I got out of there, I... I, I, I I had my own service station for a while, and uh, m man, <laughs> having a service station, <laughs> making a scent a gown, <laughs> and when when they rebuild the highway alongside of you, and no one can get in there except Oof. from the back streets. Uh, and they said they were going to dump 30,000 gallons on me a, 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 a month. I told them where to shove that <laughs> service station. <laughs> and uh, I, I went and got a job in, in Austin, Minnesota, as a lineman mm. climbing poles to string in wire. <laughs> I, I did that for four years. I, I'm a journeyman lineman. I got a journeyman license, um, and uh, so Captain Erickson finally got his wish of you being up in the up, 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 up the pole stringing poles wires. And stringing wires. <laughs> As a hard job, uh, and meanwhile, you also met Lola. Oh God, yes, I fell in love. <laughs> you said. Uh, you were, you were going out in September 1945. Soon thereafter, we were going out every night. In October, I got an engagement ring and asked her to marry me. It seemed rapid to me, but I was infatuated. October went by, then November came along, and I told Lola that it was killing me and that we had to do something about it. We arranged to have a wedding at the Lutheran Church in Austin where my sister Peg and my brother-in-law lived. November 23rd, simple wedding. She moved in. And, and she and I slept in a closet on a bed no wider than a couch. It worked out great for a while. <laughs> and plus, we're lucky you don't take up much room. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you say this, when I, got, when I came home from the service, I had the shakes, but nobody visited doctors for post-traumatic stress disorder back then. I woke up one night and I was choking Lola, so we got separate beds. She realized what I had gone through. She was there for me 100%. I had to learn how to drink coffee with my left hand because my right hand shook so much. I started taking, what is that, prop, prop, propranol? Propanol. Propanol for that and still take it to this day. So there's, there's definitely, even though you came home from the war, the war was kind of still going on in some ways. None of World War II veterans had medical help like that. In fact, when 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 I went to get medical help, I had uh, I got eleven stents in me. Eleven in your heart. Well, around oh, your heart, my heart. Around your heart. Okay. I. I, I, I I was feeling faint, and uh, went down to the hospital, and uh, they, they were checking me out, and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me, and they wanted to keep me overnight. There is a God. <laughs> so I, <clears throat> they kept me <clears throat> in the hospital and hooked me up to, to every kind of a thing like wires all over me. The, the next morning, I woke up in a neighboring hospital. <laughs> Instead of Walnut Creek, Kaiser, I, I woke up in Mount Diablo 
uh, in Concord, 25 miles away. <laughs> At two o'clock in the morning, that alarm went off. I had cardiac arrest. That means I was dead for a while. <laughs> but you were hooked up to a machine. Machine. And they that, got to work on you immediately. Uh, 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 <laughs> and got me, got me, oh uh, boy, crazy. You you tell the story in here. I mentioned that, that the picture earlier that the major took of you while you were sitting in the Jeep. And that picture got published in the newspaper. And then uh, you say this, one day I came home from work finding Lola changing her wallet. She had all the remains of her old wallet dispersed across the table. I walked by thinking nothing of it until something caught my eye. I noticed a picture of a young soldier sitting inside an army jeep. But that wasn't just any soldier, that was me. She had the picture of me in her wallet from years ago when I was in Major Ridgeway's jeep, the one that was in the local paper. I asked her, where did you get that picture? And she told me that she cut it out of the paper and put it in her wallet. I said, you didn't even know me. She said, no, but I met your brother Bob and he was talking about you. At the time, she was a sophomore going to high school. Her family had just moved two farms north of us near Hope. I never met her or her family and didn't even know she existed. While she was in high school, one of her girlfriends questioned her for keeping the photo and asked, who's the guy in this picture? She announced, that is the guy I am going to marry. How, how can you make up something like that? <laughs> <laughs> My life is un, 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 unbelievable up until then, and it keeps on go, being unbelievable. <laughs> so you have your first son, Kurt, in 1948. Uh, you, you end up with that lineman job. You have your second child, Linda, um, yeah, and, then, and then you go, you go, you become a TV radio repairman after you do the service station, you end up moving to California. When you get to California, you're doing, you're working for Sears as a TV repairman for $2 and 35 cents an hour. Your brother-in-law has a print shop up in Northern California. He offers you a hefty raise up to $3 and 42 cents an hour. And you, so you go up there and do that. You, you end up also doing TV repair on the side, working with, you know, replacing people's tubes and whatnot. So now it's years go by, and, and you say this, while working for my brother-in-law, I'd come home about 3.30 or 4 every day and then worked fixing televisions. One particular day I'll never forget, I came home from the print shop and Lola met me at the door. I said, hi, hon. Don't, Don't hunt me, you, you son, son of a, of a gun. <laughs> she put it, son of a bitch. He's, and you she, say, wow, that shook me up. What's the problem, honey? The problem is I'm pregnant, you son of a bitch. Yeah. Pregnant, you had better get the doctor to make sure. Well, the reason she was, because this is what, 10 years after your last kid? Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> t- 10 years, exactly, 10 years. Um, so that's a, you end up having another another baby. Yeah. Uh, you go to and you, there is a God. <laughs> you work at Jonas Printing. You work at Harrington McGinnis Printing for a while. Um, you end up getting a, a house. Uh, here's a conversation. In 1990, we were still living in Pleasant Hill, California, as usual. It went to uh, I, I still went to the flea market every Sunday in January. Carlin found me and said, "Mom wants to talk to you." Lola was sitting in the car with the first word out of her mouth. I knew I didn't have a chance. I knew I was screwed. She looked at me and said, Father, I've found my dream house. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but Father, that, that melted me. <laughs> so, uh, What do you mean by dream house? A house we can live in with my two sons and their families. I want you to come look at it. All I could think was, man, this is going to cost me a lot. <laughs> uh so you say the place was going to take a lot of work. So it seemed ridiculous to me to buy a new home when I was in my late sixties because I didn't know how long I'd be living. But you end up buying the house. Lola moved into the house in Martinez during the construction renovations, followed by Carlin and Kim. Then Kurt. Linda wasn't interested in moving in because she already had a home with her husband and family. I lived in Pleasant Hill while our house was up for sale. 
The housing market was slow at the time because the interest rate was at 12%. While I stayed at Pleasant Hill, the house and Martinez really came together. All of Lola's ideas coming to life. I was starting to see what she saw in that house. So you end up with a compound for the family. Yes. And, and it's it kept me alive. <clears throat> Uh, I ha- had another incident where I, I c- c- couldn't get out of bed in the morning. The alarm went off. A radio alarm, just a radio came on loud. And uh, I'm laying there thinking, like right here, right now, as sharp as my, my mind was as sharp as it is right now, but I couldn't move a muscle. I, I had a telephone right alongside of me to, to, to call my kids. I couldn't move. And I said, what the hell am I going to do now? Your bladder starts talking to you. Get me to the bathroom. Or you're going to be sorry. And... The next thing I knew, my oldest son came down from upstairs, and he says, the, the radio was going. He says, Dad, is, uh, uh, have you got a problem? Uh, Kurt, I can't move. I, I got to get to the bathroom. He says, I, I'll, I'll go get Carlin. So, so, so when they started moving me, I passed out. The next thing I knew, I was wo- woke up in Kaiser Walnut Creek. <clears throat> I had a stroke, and uh, the, the, they said if I'd have been any later, it would have affected me. I'm. Right now, I have a little kind of a my my left side. I got uh, my my left hand. It's it's wrinkled in there, mm-hmm. and my my left foot. I kind of drag my left foot. But uh, there is a God, I'll tell you that. Does it let me, my mind complete? Um, So while you were living in Pleasant Hill, you got a call. One day, Lola called me and said, Father, I want you to come down there and stay with you. I want to come down there and stay with you. Go to work and get a roll away bed. God, I... I hate to even talk about that mm. day. She said, I'm losing too much weight because I miss your kid cooking. I asked how much weight she lost. I lost 40 pounds last month. 40 pounds. Mm. You say they found out she had stomach cancer. Don't worry, Dad, Linda said. They're going to operate. They think they can get it all. They might have to take some of her stomach out, but she can live a normal life. She would have to eat less, but more often. I just wanted anything and everything done for her to keep going. The doctors opened her up, discovering that it had spread to her intestines. They gave her six weeks to live, but she lived a little longer than expected. Kurt and Carlin fixed up the room in the house that looked towards Mount Diablo so she could look out the window and enjoy the view. One of the last things she saw was that view. It's a beautiful sight. A day doesn't go by when I don't think of her knowing that she's guiding me. She wrote a poem about me. I never was much on poetry, but Lola loved to write. She titled the poem, One of the Lucky. My husband was one of many, a Second World War volunteer who left home to go serve his country, 
this land that we all love so dear. He never complained. He was lonesome, surrounded by enemy guns. The letters he wrote home were cheerful, like the battle was only fun. In his foxhole there, death sat beside him with shells whistling over his head. He tried to remember his childhood, tucked safely away in his bed. His buddies, they fell by the dozen, on the beach their lives ebbing away. In my heart, I think God had watched over him when he made it to cover that day. Time and again, he was lucky. He still ran when his best buddies fell. A dodging and jumping and dying in this man-made inferno to hell. But the day came when his nerves had shattered and the general so plainly could see this boy should no longer see battle. So they sent him home safely to me. Yeah. Beautiful poem. <clears throat> Shakes me up. Mm. Shakes me up. Well, you you uh you were very lucky, not just to avoid machine guns and bombs and everything else. You were also very lucky that you met your beautiful wife and you were able to spend so much time with her. I I tell you, somebody up there likes me. I can't figure it out. Somebody must like me. <laughs> Or like what the way I do things. Um, even after Lola died, you kept working. And then finally in 1995, when you were 73, your boy said, Dad, we don't want you to work anymore. You retired after working for 19 years at Harrington McGinnis. But then you still kept a schedule. So how, how old were you when you retired? Oh, 73. But you... You'd run errands and, and cook for the family, taking the kids all over the place to different schools and stuff. <laughs> had to, you had to stay focused, had a new mission. I, I had a new responsibility in life. I, I, I had a granddaughter who, who was three when I was 73. <sighs> And I became the soul raiser of her. She, she's a dancer on a cruise ship now, a dancer, singer. And she is the one responsible for putting me on TikTok. <laughs> I would not be here right now. She, she's mostly responsible for this book. Yeah. yeah. It's un unbelievable. <laughs> it is unbelievable. Luckily, you're sitting here to see that it is believable. <laughs> yes. It's, it's, it's crazy, crazy. Mm. Uh, you know, you we, 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 a little earlier in the book, you were talking about having the shakes in your, in your hand. And you say, I came out of World War II with the shakes in my right arm. I couldn't pick up a cup of coffee without shaking, without my hand shaking, so I learned to drink with my left hand. I took medication for it, but it didn't alleviate it completely. And then one time you fell down. Yep. And when you fell down, you went to the hospital, you were knocked out, you went to the hospital, you got 30 stitches, uh, uh, 30 stitches in your head. In the side and, of my head. Here. And 29 Two, stitches in your right hand. Yeah. Uh, you went, they got a bunch of MRIs and whatnot. Um. The, the, before you went in the MRI machine, I got to read this part. You said, I got down to the MRI room and the guy who was operating the MRI machine said, I have to ask you a few questions before I put you in the machine. I replied, go right ahead. He asked me a series of questions like, what year is it, etc. Then he asked, are you pregnant? I answered, I've been screwed so many times, I ought to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, the MRI came back without any problems, but... But you, the shake went away after after seventy years. 
Yeah, now, now, now we're sitting here. I want you to look at this. I, I, I could be an eye doctor. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, I, 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 think of it. I, I couldn't hold a cup of coffee in that hand yeah. before the, I fell on my left side. <sighs> and left side, right hand, it, it, it correlates. That's a miracle. I am a miracle <laughs> itself. It, it's crazy. And so then you end up getting cataract surgery. You've been colorblind your whole life. And what happens after cataract surgery? I, I, I get my color vision back <laughs> on Easter Sunday. It's Easter Sunday. <sighs> crazy. So you can see color now. I, I, I see color now. You were colorblind your whole life. I. See, you say you see all these colors. I can't tell you what color that is, but it's kind of an orangey red. Uh -huh. Yes, it is. But, but, but uh, and that's a blue. <laughs> yes, in it there. is. But but I, I I see all these colors. I don't know the names of them because <laughs> I was brought up without. Color. Unbelievable. It's crazy. And the you know, you mentioned earlier going over going being having the opportunity to go to the seventy fifth anniversary of D Day. Part of that was because of a of a donations on a GoFundMe to get you sent over there. Well, that, that, that's a very interesting thing be, be, because all my service records were burned up in Kentucky in 1973. The L's and the M's were burned up. So uh, I, I, I don't know if I put this in uh, uh, about the uh, one medal that I, I did get. The Bronze Star, Earl Heaps, was a newcomer to the bagel shop group, and he he was a sergeant in Korea, and he says, "Do you ever get any medals, Jake?" Yeah, I says, "I got the Bronze Star." He says, "Bring bring it in." Uh, I've never seen the Bronze Star. We had just moved from Ple Pleasant Hill into uh, our home in Martinez. So uh, I looked for that Bronze Star. I could not find it. I looked every place. I, where would I? My God, what happened to that thing? But. Then my daughter said, uh, Linda says, uh, Dad, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll just uh, write to the Army and have it replaced. I said, you can do that? Oh, yeah, they'll, they'll replace it for you. So, so I went up and told Earl Heaps that uh, I couldn't find it, that they were going to replace it. A month later, Linda came to me and says, Dad, uh, uh, they, they, they don't know what uh, anything about your Bronze Star. They, all your records were burned in Kentucky, and they don't even know if you served in the service. <laughs> I don't they, they, they don't. Man, that's a shaker up, huh? <laughs> and uh, so, so I tried to find out, and man, I, 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 I'm a, a GI, three years overseas. I don't even have VA help for for a doctor or anything. And it's probably a damn good thing because I'm still alive. <laughs> uh, I don't think they would give 11 cents to me in, in the VA. Oh, man. Um, you, uh, 
But they ended up raising money for you, and, and you found your bronze star. Yeah, I found. Uh, you, it's uh, in the book. Uh, you found your bronze star. I've got to tell you about this. Uh, when I went back and told Earl Heaps that uh, my bronze star was lost, and they 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 told me we we don't even know if you served in the service, and Earl Heaps says. Well, then we don't have to believe a damn thing you've told us. <laughs> you've been telling us. Oh, man, that, that's a stabber. <laughs> but you did find the bronze. Oh, star. we found a bronze. In an old ammo can or something. In an ammunition box. And here's the irony of the thing it was some 40 caliber ammunition. And. I asked who who wanted that ammunition. I didn't want that around. I had some uh, handguns that fit, and uh, I've got too, too many gran grandchildren. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, Earl Heaps says, I I'll, I'll take it. I've got some here. Earl Heaps, the, the one who told me, we don't have to believe a damn thing you told us. <laughs> I opened that ammunition box, and there that, Bronze Star was laying in the box right on top. I, I don't remember putting it on in there, and uh, no one else did too. Mm -hmm. But uh, that, 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 when I could produce the Bronze Star, <laughs> Earl uh, had to eat his he, words. He had to eat his words. <laughs> did I say that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did. Um. So you raise the money, you end up going to Normandy, and you talked about this, but I, I just want to read this section because it's so moving. You, you say, we drove straight from Paris to Normandy to the American cemetery. The first grave I saw was a private from the 1st Infantry Division. That choked me up because I went on in on D-Day with members of the 1st Infantry Division, and now I was looking down at his grave 75 years later. It's kind of a weird feeling. I made it, and he didn't. Look at the family I have while he has nothing. War is so unfair. I took off my hat, thanking him for paving the way for me. I teared up and walked away. I never realized the cemetery had over 9,000 Americans. I was never one for visiting cemeteries. There are souls still hanging around, but this visit was different. I owed it to those who had been killed to pay my respects. And as you mentioned earlier, you ended up doing a bunch of interviews for f French TV and CBS. And hey, I, 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 I want to add two. Mm. One th that you'll never hear anybody else say. F from Russia, f from Moscow, a, a, a young girl came, came up to me after the, the, the five... Uh, other ones came, were done. She came up and said, I'm from Moscow, Russia, and I'd like to interview you. Perfect English. Mm. I've, I've never heard that uh, anyone being interviewed from anybody from Russia. It's crazy. <laughs> hmm. Um. <clears throat> that you also went back to Omaha Beach itself. And you say here, I returned to a section of Omaha Beach where I walked on the sand for the first time in 75 years with my family and news oh, groups. That burl, and I found that burl. And I, was, God. Uh, I tell you, it's hard for me to talk about it. You, you, can't, you can't imagine what we're going to the memories that come back to you. And here I'm standing there with my son, mm. my two sons. It's, uh, because you ended up seeing a berm that was basically exactly what yeah, you had I, hid behind. It, it, it's like, like it was recreated for me. How, how is that possible? Uh, 
Um, they had a big ceremony. Uh, you shook the president's hand at the ceremony. Yeah, President uh, Trump's hand. Did a bunch more interviews. And uh, you say this, the D-Day anniversary trip was the trip of a lifetime that I will never forget. What a moving memory surpassing D-Day in my mind. There was no killing and we were celebrating. It was the epitome of my life. I'm so grateful for all the people who came together in order for me to make it back there. I never in my life thought I would return to that beach, but I'm glad that I did. I did not return for myself, but instead for my fellow soldiers who did not make it. And all those interviews that you did, you know, the, the word spread. You ended up hearing from uh, Corporal Madison Rich. You ended up hearing God. from his kids. <laughs> About the gun incident breaking in two. Man, he, he, he told his children about that. Uh, I I did. I never had much contact. We were working when we got out of service. We didn't have time for messing around, and talking about what we did in in the service. But uh, after he passed away, his wife contacted me, and. Uh, I, I kept in contact with her for the years, and then she passed away. And uh, man, all of a sudden, I'm over in Europe. I'm, I'm in Europe celebrating the, the 75th anniversary of D-Day. And uh, in New York, uh, 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 I'm a man there. Is listening and Jake Larson they're talking about Jake Larson, uh, so he calls his brother in in New Jersey. He says, "Frank, are you watching that thing about D Day, the seventy fifth anniversary of D?" Yeah, he says, "I am." I wonder if that Jake Larson they're talking about is the same one Dad used to talk about. When the rifle broke in two, and he was laid his rifle on the thing. Uh, so they got a hold of my youngest son, Carlin. He's kind of takes care of all my appointments and things. And um, they, they they called him, and uh, he so some hey, I, w- I wonder if that Jake Larson is the same guy that uh, my dad was talking about. And Carlin said, well, well, what's your dad's name? He says, Madison Rich. <laughs> Carlin said, that's the same one. <laughs> I personally got, got in contact. Those two, two, two girls and two boys of Madison Rich contacted me. We talked on the phone face to face. And the oldest boy came down and saw me personally. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful thing. Madison Rich did not make 70 years old. My God, I worked till I was 73. And here I sit going on 99. There's something wrong in the equation. How one person could could do these things. Uh, I, I need help. To that. Why, why am I still here? How come I don't have aches or pains like anybody else? Life is crazy. There well, is a uh, God. Uh, yeah, and there is somebody that, somebody, I guess if you look at the world, there's got to be somebody that actually is the luckiest man in the world. And that's the name of the book. And I think we're finding out it's nonfiction. <laughs> it's, it, it, it certainly is a non, nonfiction. And I, I, I'm not a writer. 
I, I, I'm just telling you stories of my life, the, the way they come up. I, I don't have big words. You, you don't see anything big in there, but uh, it, it's the way I talk. That's the only way I know how to write. I'm, I'm, I'm not right to, to impress anybody with, with my verbiage. The stories themselves are impressive enough. The, the verbiage is secondary. <laughs> the stories are amazing in here. Yeah. Um, another thing that you did was take uh, an honor flight, and the honor flight is a nonprofit organization, great people, and they provide, their, their, their mission is to provide veterans with honor and closure. And so they fly veterans to Washington, D.C. Um, to, to see the war memorials. And your name came up on there, and so you ended up going to Washington, D.C., thanks to the private donations to the, to the honor flight organization, which is a great organization, like I said. And you said this when you got there. Um, I was ticked off because they took so long to complete the World War II Memorial, only opening in 2004. By that time, most of the men from the war were gone and would never have the chance to see it. Carlin convinced me that I should go in their memory, so that's why I went. The irony is that the 135th Infantry, which is part of the 34th Division, has a shield that says, to the last man. I was 15 years old the first time I saw that. Well, they are all gone except me. Who would ever imagine that I would actually be the last man? I got that shield right here on my jacket. Mm. Uh, and then came the Battle of the Bulge 75th anniversary. And and there's a guy named Mitch Mendler. Well, oh, firefighter, a paramedic here, right here in San Diego, as a matter yeah, of fact. Yeah. And, I was with him last night. And he's the president of a nonprofit organization called World Memorials and doing great work with that. And they volunteered to sponsor you to get you out to the to the seventy fifth anniversary of the Battle of the Bulge. And um, you say here, when we went to the airport, flew down to Los Angeles, I was met at the gate by my sponsor group who introduced me to two of the men entrusted to travel with me. Colonel Mike Droll of the Arizona Rangers and Rick Cochran, the executive director, Hispanic Medal of Honor. Joshua Kaufman, a Holocaust survivor who survived five concentration camps was amongst the group. When U.S. troops liberated him at the age of 16, he weighed a mere 55 pounds. His daughter interpreted it for him in Yiddish, informing him that I was going back for D-Day. When she communicated that I was the only one left in my company, he, Joshua Kaufman, got down on his hands and knees and kissed my feet. That choked me up. He got up and grabbed my hand and said, love you, and squeezed my hand. We were both crying. Mm, that's some incredible, uh, you know, they mentioned closure, actually meeting a, an individual that had been in the concentration camps and was liberated by Americans such as yourself that's amazing. It, it, only seven years difference in our life. I was 22 hmm. when that happened. You know, I've, I've read a bunch of this book so far um, tonight, and I know we've been talking for a while, but I wanted to close the book out with this, this last section that I'll read. And again, if there's so much more in this book. I've only cut covered a couple of the, the highlights, but there's, it was hard to even select which highlights to cover because it's all just incredible stories. But I wanted to close with this quote here. 
It says, it's mind-boggling to have someone kiss your feet in thanks for what those soldiers did. I am not the one to be kissed. I'm representing all the guys who freed all the concentration camp victims. It was their actions. I'm not a hero. I'm here too. I'm here to tell you what I went through. All these people are gone and I'm left alone. I can't see where I deserve the credit for that. I'm the last one alive to represent these guys that gave their lives over there so I could relate relate this story to everyone. And again, the the story um, is incredible. You know, uh, you lived it, and you're sitting across the table from me, and you even realize how incredible and almost unbelievable it is, and you are doing an outstanding job carrying on and passing on the story of your your brothers, your comrades in arms. They're the and, heroes. They're the heroes. <clears throat> and And... So you're carrying on that story, and that's not the end of the story, by the way, because like you said earlier, you're very popular on social media. You're a TikTok star. You're on Instagram, you're on YouTube. Um, it's all under the same title, which is Story Time with Papa Jake. You have hundreds of thousands of followers, and you have millions of views on some of your stories. Of course, this book, but it's just, uh, it's incredible. And the story's not over yet. Well, I hope it is. <laughs> I hope it isn't for a, for a while. But, but uh, how did it start with the TikTok thing? The, 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 my granddaughter, I told you, I raised since she was three years old, dances on a cruise ship. Coronavirus came. Mm. Cru- cruise ships quit. She came home. She's a, a, a very special person to, to, to her grandpa, and uh, she, she, she came over one mo- morning and s- sat there. She says, uh, Papa, I put you on TikTok with me. <laughs> what in the <laughs> hell is TikTok? <laughs> I, uh, uh, TikTok, she says, it, 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 it's a... Uh, a radio thing, she says, and uh, I said, what did you put me on TikTok? She says, well, while you were talking to me about one of your th- things happening, I, I, I recorded it and put it on TikTok. At the end of the week, she came over, she says, Papa, I'm taking you, taking you off of my TikTok and putting you on your own. What, what are you doing that for? <laughs> My God, leave it alone. I says, you're opening a can of worms here. <laughs> she says, Papa, I, it took me seven months to get 10,000 viewers. Seven months. She says, y- you surpassed me in one week. I said, w- w- what does that mean? She says, it, it, it means that people like to hear you tell stories. So that's where I'm at right now. <clears throat> well, well, it's an amazing story. Um, and you're on, you're not just on TikTok, you're on Instagram. There's a YouTube channel uh, that people can, if people don't have TikTok, they can watch it on YouTube, they can watch it on Instagram. Um, I mean, you can even Google me and get a response. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> the book is called "The Luckiest Man in the World." It's a fantastic read. It's just it's it's an unbelievable story. And if it wasn't if we weren't sitting here talking to the man himself, you'd have a hard time believing it. But but there he is. And so so definitely um, pick up the book and and it's just incredible. Um, Echo. Yes, sir. Do you have any questions at this time? I do not have any questions at this time. Really? Thank you, sir. No. Echo usually asks like some kind of interesting question at the end, but maybe today we didn't just, you know. We covered it. I'm surprised he, he cause I'm surprised, I thought you were gonna ask farming questions. Okay. I thought you were gonna talk about chickens or horses. No, no, no. Or no. something like that, nothing, no, huh? Pretty straightforward, I think, at this time. Papa Jake's, Papa Jake Larson, 
Um, we've had you for two hours right now. I, I, I want to be respectful of your time, but if there's any other final thoughts you want to share? Amazon is the printer of my book. So, uh, and make sure you mention my name. There is another book called The Luckiest Man in the World. We found out my, because somebody ordered that book and the wrong book came to him. So, uh, Are we going to have to have a contest between you two to see who's I, I, actually I, I, luckier? I, 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 don't, I don't know. I haven't even read it. So, uh, But uh, I want to thank you for, for the honor of sitting here. It is an honor for me because I think by, by telling this story, you, you will more honor those who gave their lives for, for me to be here. I would not be here without those guys that, that sacrificed themselves for, for me. There is a God. That's my final word. Well, sir, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for your family to get for getting us down here. Our friend Jack that connected us. Um, thanks for being here and, and thanks for sharing your wisdom. But most important, thank you for your service to this great nation. You and your friends and your generation stood against tyranny and evil and allow us to live under this blessing of freedom today. So we thank you and all your brothers in arms. Well, well thank you, sir, for, for allowing me to do this. Uh, and I appreciate very much what you're doing for me. Well, we are grateful, grateful for you and grateful for your service and sacrifice and the service and sacrifice of all of your comrades in arms and, and especially, as you have mentioned, the real heroes that did not come home. They're the, they're the ones. God bless them all. Indeed, sir. Thank you. And with that, Papa Jake Larson has left the building. Yes, sir. And clearly, um, an honor to be able to have him on and hear those stories and you know talking to him before and after man you know he he kept saying he doesn't have any pain and and he's doing great he's doing great 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 cuz you know during the podcast we weren't we're not really yucking it up or cracking jokes but we're downstairs he's I, we're cracking jokes and even before the podcast started i he said something about me Mm. Like he he took a shot at me, <laughs> and I went right back at him talking about being bald, mm. and he he like laughing, and he's just totally sharp. Um, man, just an honor to be able to have him on here. And I, you didn't have any questions. That was kind of surprising to me. No, like my I I was wondering, and actually now like kind of thinking about thinking about it more. Let's say clearly or whatever. Um, you always kind of wonder about the experience from would it be in the boat you know landing yeah. and then going on he did you know he talked about it kind of for lack of a better term kind of vaguely where he'd be like yeah i'm dodging bullets mm -hmm. yeah i'm running i'm running trying to get away whatever that was sort of it it wasn't like a like a narrative like of boom landing yeah. Yeah. like what happened you know i'm thinking save it private saving private ryan all this mm -hmm. stuff you know i want to hear that you know because the, there was a lot of reflections of saving private ryan by the way well, for sure it's freaking d-day yeah he, you know? he, the shakes like that thing mm -hmm. um there was another one too oh when he went and when he was looking for a match right for his cig mm -hmm. cigarettes and then he goes oh hey you got a match he didn't say you got a match on saving private ryan yeah, but but he does he was like hey something and he looks boom the guy had no face yep boom dang that's crazy yeah the book and, and the book has more details and and you know it's it's there's a balance right of wanting to read some of the book and then getting some of his reflections on what he went through so yeah. um but just it's just awesome to have someone like that i mean literally to go from d-day to the battle of the bulge is crazy yeah. it's crazy and 
you know, the, he has this jacket, which I'll post on, on the interwebs or whatever, but it has all the little campaigns that he was in. It's, you know, D-Day, St. Lowe, going, going right down, Paris. I kind of rattled him off, mm. you know, but it just, um, it's unbelievable. It's an honor. Obviously, a ton to learn and a ton to reflect on. So thanks, uh, thanks to Jack out there in the, in the, in the world who put this together, one of our jujitsu bros sure. made the connection, yep. told you, told you we could possibly, you know, get in touch with him. And, and then you were kind enough to respond to him seven months after he initially sent his initial, you know, email, which was good. Yeah, man. We like that <laughs> the timing and stuff. <laughs> yes, but, sir. Um, what, when I walk away from this, I just think to myself, you know, as, as Papa Jake, kept saying you know all these all these other individuals that didn't make it you know he's looking at that gravestone thinking this guy didn't get to have the family the life and he did get to have that chance and guess what so do we so it seems like we should be doing our best to live a life that is worthy of those sacrifices seems like a good plan yeah, it's it's crazy to to think, you know, now being the age that we are, to think like how he mentioned his friend in the Air Force mm-hmm. who died at like 20, nineteen yeah. years old. Yeah. That's not even half your life, Paul. That's mm-hmm. like you're technically you're not even a full adult, yeah. really. And just that's you know that's the end. I guess you're a full adult if you're in Hope, Minnesota, because you're up at year six years old milking 32 cows every morning oh, and yeah. at night. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, yeah, that's you're really it's so cool sure. to read that stuff. It's cool to read that stuff in the book, for sure, mm-hmm. what it was like living back then. Yeah, I, yeah. They didn't have electricity. Yeah. He, he, they didn't have electricity in their house until he got out of the service in 1945. It's crazy. Or f- Yeah, 45. He's all like, oh, that was a big jump from the horse and buggy. Yep. <laughs> Yep, that was life. We think we think like, oh, I went from a, you know, a V six to a V eight. Whoa, Uh, that was amazing change, and I'm so much better off now. Got that GPS now. Yeah, I got that GPS system. They're in horse and buggy. What about what about this whole scenario? Well, you know, my school is 14 miles away, and in the winter time, the only way to get there is by horse and sleigh. (laughs) Sleigh. Yeah, Yeah, man. And by the way, another thing. They don't. They're not wearing Gore-Tex, yeah. Thinsulate, freaking, you know, pile, yeah. polyester. They're in wool, yeah. at best. Yeah. Some canvas jacket, right? Yeah. Just a different time. Different time. Freaking epic. It's crazy so. how he, uh, you know, he's colorblind, like all this stuff, and then he falls down. He didn't say how he fell down. That was the question I should have asked. Like, how, why did he fall down? Like, how did he fall? Just he randomly? Tripped, he tripped over a curb. Okay. So, you know a parking curb? Yes, sir. He tripped over one of those. He was just like looking off ahead and just yeah. hit it. Boom. Hits his head. Color blindness cured. And what else was cured? No, the, ca- the color blindness was cured when he got cataract surgery. Oh. Uh-huh. There's a section in the book called Medical Miracles or something okay. like that. And right. it covers all these things. He mentioned some of them. Oh, yeah. His shakes got cur- yeah, cured. His shakes okay. got cured, cured so, when he got hit in the head. Okay. So you're, you, yeah, you're the correct generation. Okay. You remember Nintendo Entertainment System, the original NES? I, I remember it, but I don't, I remember that it was a thing, but it's not something that I had. It wasn't your jam. All right. You Because we didn't have electricity in my house. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. So no that, we we didn't have any money for that kind of thing Brutal. but the, I, that might be too strong my dad was like a computer he was into computers before computers were really a thing mm. and so he had old school computers yeah but because you have an old school computer you're not getting some game system some right? computers, oh. yeah so he was and plus he thought that a computer was for computing right not sure. for playing a game gotcha so there was no we never had any of those systems. Now we have one game playing system, but we did have a computer. Do you know? Do you know about old old school computers? I do. Yes. Do you know what a Commodore VIC twenty is? Well, you know the, that model specifically. You know, it's the first model. Look. Okay, Commodore. It's for the first sure. model. Yeah. I want to say that the imbe- the memory that came with the machine itself yeah. was two K. 
and then there were some <laughs> cartridge that you plugged in yeah. that gave you an extra 4K. Yeah, yeah. This computer was weak. Yes, very weak. Either way, Atari. N- what n- Nintendo? No, 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 okay. not Atari. So you didn't even have Atari then? Nope. No Atari. Nope, no Atari. <sighs> Brutal. It's kind of abuse. And eventually we had, abuse. we had, like versions of the games that were on Atari. Yeah. But instead of it being called Pac Man, yeah. it was a generic version called like Snack Man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because my dad, <laughs> yes, I, sir. my I dad understand. was a cheap human. I understand. He was not, fully. You're not spending money on anything. I understand. This was when you get, he, he was part of like a sharing group where they would trade cassette tapes that had this information on it that you could play the game. Yeah. So we're talking just. Okay. <laughs> So okay, okay. I, I, this might I not be it. horse and buggy, but we're I understand fully. Yep, and yeah, you, you lived on a dirt road too. So mm-hmm. hey, man, I get it. Um, well, either way, the uh, the rest of the ninety nine point nine percent of us that got our <laughs> Nintendo Entertainment <laughs> System know that there's when you're in when you Nintendo got kind of older, mm-hmm. and it would jam up, right? Mm-hmm. You put the game in, you stuff it down, and it and it it blinks or whatever. It doesn't mm-hmm. turn on. So there's two two methods. To get it going, everyone knows the the one. You take the game out, you blow it, you blow on it because mm-hmm. there might be dust in there. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I think it's psychological. Either way, that you put it back in, it usually works. Second method is you turn it off and you hit the side of the thing. You hit it just like a even For like real. a TV. No yeah, you technique. hit it. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, we do it all the time. Um, TV's kind of like that too. I think that's how Papa Jake's head was. Mm-hmm. You hit his head, boom, oh. shakes, gone. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> Maybe they should have blew in his eyes or something. Maybe that would have worked. I'm Kinda just saying. Crazy. Nintendo, Papa Jake. These lessons are everywhere. Lessons are everywhere. But um, it, you know what is incredible? Mm. His, his, he is real, just incredibly sharp mm-hmm. and healthy, walking up and down the stairs, no factor. Yeah. Just awesome. Um, makes me think about health. Yeah. Mental and physical health. Yeah. How we can try and maintain that as long as possible. Yeah, it's true. All right, well, we got some solutions to that. Look at okay. that segue. Yes, Look sir. at that yes, segue. Sir. Yep. Okay. Oh, I yep. kind of threw you a nice little softball. <laughs> You're just rolling. Yeah. Well, hey, we're working out. Yeah. Right? We're, shoot, Papa Jake. If I don't make a, let's face it, if there's no, if, if there's not a segue, we're talking about, we, I mean, we're we were just talking about Commodore VIC 20s. Yep. Right? We were way off base. Well, so if there's no segue to get us back, you know, who knows what's happening? I understand. You're correct. So, segue occurred. Yep. Now we're we're back on track. Yeah, back into the workouts. Right. Papa Jake was 120 pounds. See, that's another thing you got to remember where it's not like it's like freaking Jocko rolling up through, you know. You know how you guys talk about like all the gear that you guys carry or yeah. whatever? It's like, bro, 120 carrying gear. Bro, that's like some effort. Well, he said he had 75 pounds of gear plus his weapon. So, we're talking. That's a massive amount. That's the over double body weight. Yeah. Now, I did. I can tell you that guys nowadays carry way more gear than they did back then. Yeah. For the most, for the most part, especially like in Nam. Yeah. In Nam, you were just carrying two. Ca- well, let me let me get more specific here. The seals in Vietnam, one canteen, four grenades, a bunch of mags, and your weapon. Like those guys yeah. rolled light, light, light. Mm. And yeah. nowadays, man, you're going. You got radios. You got. So much ammo. You got body armor. You got helmet. You got night visions. You got lasers. You got extra batteries for everything. It, yeah. It's just a lot more. Yeah, which is not good, by the way, in many cases. Yeah, so makes sense. Either way, when you're 120, yep. bro, you better be going extra light. Otherwise, that's gonna take some effort. So, nonetheless, that's neither here nor nor there as far as right now. Right now, we're trying to be as strong as we can. I don't care 120, 180, 190, mm-hmm. two bills, whatever. We're trying to be as strong as we can over here <laughs> and as smart as we can, all this stuff, right? Yes. Look, not all of us are going to reach 99, by the way. Hey, mm-hmm. this is just the reality of the situation, but we're going to try. Cool. Mm-hmm. So we've got to do good stuff for our minds and our body. Don't worry. We got you. Don't Man. worry. Jocko has supplements. Yeah. We got you, including energy drinks. Sure, yeah. we all know about it, but we're going to go over it. Okay. <laughs> energy drinks with sugar, bad. I'm going to simplify it. Yeah. Bad. But- energy drinks with preservatives and poisons. Bad. bad energy drinks without preservatives and poisons good, good. as long as there's no sugar good, good. okay perfect <laughs> Jock discipline go mm. energy drink sweetened with monk fruit a fruit natural mm-hmm. no preservatives pasteurized an mm-hmm. actual healthy energy drink bacopa alpha gpc 
These are good things for yep. you. Literally good for you. Literally good. For oh, but what about the what about the downside? I I have yet to find a downside at all. Oh wait, there's no downside. Oh yeah, when you run out, I can, that's the downside. We have to be watching out for downsides. What can be the downside? I can tell you what the downside is. Hmm. Possibly, mm-hmm. if you drink it too late in the afternoon, mm-hmm. you might not go to sleep very early. <laughs> well, yeah. You can actually put yourself into a tough situation if you have one at let's say six o'clock or seven o'clock at night. Yeah, and let's, and here's the thing. There's a disclaimer with that too because that depends on your tolerance for caffeine. True. So you gotta have, kind of be sensitive to it to actually have that problem because it's only 95 milligrams. Mm-hmm. It's like a regular, co- it's actually not even that big of a cup of coffee. It's like a right. regular like cup cup. Mm-hmm. Does anyone drink one cup of coffee anymore? I don't know. Yeah, I don't think so. Not that I know, but I don't know. Either way, nonetheless, you, nonetheless, as they say, nonetheless, it does have a little bit of caffeine for the little little boost, yeah. but all the other good stuff is a healthy thing. I was in uh, Hawaii, Kauai, my mm-hmm. homeland. Yeah, we were. And I was talking to my dad. My dad's seventy five, mm-hmm. so I'm telling him about him about my energy drink. But th- like, kind of in the beginning, I was like, oh, God, this is not going to apply right, to you him. Keep saying Jocko has an energy drink, but I'm not the only one at this table that has. An energy it's drink. It's true, and I'm preaching it. Because there's an Echo Charles energy drink. Uh, and, and I'm preaching it. But at first, I'm like, oh, man, why am I even telling you? Like, Brad, this is something funny. I'm not going to drink energy drinks. But then I'm thinking, wait, yeah, he why can. Yeah. He can straight up drink this energy drink and be good. Mm-hmm. Good to go. So, yeah. BC. Good. That's a BC. Yep. A wise man. Um, so, so you can get that. You yes, can get many that. different flavors. You mentioned mine. Mm-hmm. Mine is mango, mm-hmm. the best. Bro, ask around. It's the best. Yeah. Interesting, maybe not too conceptually. Yeah. Unless, if you don't like the mango, there's all kinds of other flavors yep. too sour apple sniper, orange, all this stuff. Look into it, chocolatefuel.com. so you can get this stuff. Also, for your joints, uh, Papa Jake's talking about his joints don't even hurt. Yeah, okay, that's how I want to be. Yeah, see what I'm saying? <clears throat> and currently, that's how I am. My joints don't hurt either. See what I'm saying? It's because of the joint warfare and the super krill oil. I didn't bring any in Hawaii. <sighs> Did you feel it? How I long? Did, how many days did it take before you felt four. it? Four. Four days. Yeah, four days. Yep. It could That's have been the bed thing. I was sleeping on didn't help either. But it was not, one time I felt, felt it in my knee though. That's not a bed, bro. Yeah, no, the bed That's cannot make your knee. Warfare. I think. And plus, true. you got the loose knees, the loose skinny knees. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. I was doing squats too, though. Squats on vacation. I'm just saying. Yeah. You want to yeah. stay in the game? Give squats on vacation. Credit. When you travel or just general life. Yeah. Protect yourself, immune wise. Yeah. Vitamin D, D3. You can get that. You can get Cold War. I just had to jack some Cold War up yeah. right now. Because, you know, you get that little. <coughs> sure. To me, when I feel that, I'm like, where's that Cold War? Started hitting it hard. Mulk. By the way, yeah. we're just having a discussion. Uh, and look, we all know that you have your favorite. Yes, sir. Which is fine. You might, maybe your favorite's peanut butter, strawberry, whatever. That's cool. The fact is, after a month, it's good to have that alter- alternate alternate opportunity to get into some you know it's good to have that alternate <laughs> yeah, opportunity to get into some mint, yep. get into some vanilla get into some chocolate get into some banana cream which is out now by the way have you had the banana cream yet i have been lucky enough to have the opportunity to have banana bomber yes. and your assessment is well i didn't taste it yet so oh, okay. it just came in like it came in while i was gone and i opened it i have I, I have a very strong uh assessment team Sure. To taste things, it's my family. Sure, because they don't care yeah, about they, anything. They yeah, will, yeah. they will smack me with whatever. And banana bomber, phew, boom, they liked uh, it. Approved. Five stars across the board, okay. which is legit. Because yeah. they will look. Like I said, they have no issue with telling me if something sucks. Yeah, they'll be all into it. And plus, they're also into stuff. There is it a thing? Okay, I am. You know, you know what a foodie is. Yes, right. we do. Yeah, right. It's a thing. Yeah, right? it's a thing. And I think it's more of a thing now than it ever was. Like when we were younger. Yeah, there wasn't a thing. Yeah, no one would ever say I'm really into food. They wouldn't even say that. Right, right, right. There was no thing like that. Yeah, it was just like food. It's like wine taster, right? Like I'm into wine tasting, but instead of wine, it's food. Mm. I think. So I think people, kids, younger people these days have more, more appreciation and sensitivity to. Taste. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So, because I'm kind of like, hmm, I'll if I can stomach it, it tastes good. <laughs> Straight up <laughs> insensitive. Yeah. Yeah. Guy, taste, <laughs> if I yeah. can stomach it, it tastes good. Yeah. If I can't, then it's not good, right? Those sure. are, I'm pretty binary. I understand. But my fully. kids, man, they're freaking. So, 
when they start getting kind of hyped about something, I yeah. know it's good. So, you know, Banana Bomber. Yeah, and Banana's one of those, and I don't know, maybe I'm alone on this, but mm-hmm. maybe I'm not. Banana is the kind where it's like, okay, but it's good, it's fine, it's fine. Mm-hmm. But let's say, you know, when you got your more exotic fruits, mm-hmm. you don't want to ruin but, it with some banana. But you usually add bananas sometimes. Oddly, yes. Yeah. And that that's not normal. We got to send some to Tulsi because Tulsi is kind of the original banana adder, right? Sure, she had, the, she had the specific method, yeah, the very innovative, yeah, right. for sure. She's always on top of things. She's just out ahead of the curve. Yeah, that's, you know, that's <laughs> she just, how. just in the game. She's got an yeah. open mind, and she looks, and she assesses, and she comes up with a solution <laughs> set. <laughs> yeah, the frozen banana, you're so, right. So frozen, rotten banana. Was it rotten? Uh, uh, we'll say extremely, uh, right. extremely right. Yes, okay. sir. But, but the banana, okay, so oddly, banana is like that whatever. Been the, we should have made the signature flavor for Tulsi, banana. Oh, yeah, huh? mm-hmm. frozen banana. Check. But um, it's like cucumber, where it's like cool, cool cucumber is fine. But if you get something that's like way better than cucumber, and then you add cucumber, cucumber makes it go to the middle of the road with it, so it kind of brings it down. Mm-hmm. That's the nature of cucumbers, <laughs> and that's the nature of <laughs> bananas too. From have you ever time been to, to time. a fancy uh, hotel where they have water and there's cucumbers in the water? Yes, sir. Do you like that? I, I like I like the effort for sure, mm. but I like the lemons like better. Yeah, or lemons in Hawaii, way better. Strawberry way better. Bro, pineapple. All pineapple day. all day. Bro, okay, so cucumbers to me, bring me some plain water. Yeah, honestly, you know they tried the cucumber Gatorade too. Remember back when I was young and uh, younger than I am now. But cucumber it, it, Gatorade, yeah, no, no good. Correct. You're, you're who's you're, the freaking idiot on the marketing crew that was like, hey, let's make cucumber Gatorade. I I don't <laughs> that have that info. Be fired. But surprisingly, right. so the point is with the banana, surprisingly, and actually not so surprisingly. So I like banana. Okay, cool, fine. But it brings things to banana level if it's better than banana, which is a bad thing. But you go banana cream. You ever had a banana cream pie? Yeah, Bro, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. freaking <laughs> legit. It's almost like it kind of supersedes. Yeah. It transcends the, the banana <laughs> stigma. You're you see what I'm saying? You're I'm foodie. over here just here to tell You're you. I'm foodie. just here to tell you. And this banana cream, this is what I expect. I didn't taste it yet. Yeah. But this is what I expect. That's what I expect with a banana cream bomb. You know what's interesting about this? You can tell you've been gone for a while because you and I are talking to go deep on <laughs> stuff. And it's also funny because you'd think maybe we had something, you know, interesting to talk about yeah, no. in a broad sense. No. Mm, We're literally talking about awesome. cucumbers and bananas, hey, which hey, is jacked up. This is, this is info. Uh, yeah. We're hurting people's lives right now. <laughs> <laughs> We're taking time away from them. So check it out. Yes, get milk. Yes, you can get this stuff from jockofuel.com. You can get it. You can get the drinks at Wawa. You can get everything at the vitamin shop go hit that stuff up go get it and and by the way jockofuel.com if you subscribe to any of these things you get the shipping for free that way we compete with the large global corporations that are trying to take over the world it's true help us compete go subscribe yeah man it's true we can help you stay healthy you know speaking of large global well corporations taking over the world you know how they you know, use you know what 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 they do is they do this mass thing where they get the labor for as cheap as they can. Yep, they get it free if they if they can. They will try they, for sure. Yeah, if they can. See, it doesn't work like that. Mm-hmm. It's not sustainable. See, what I'm saying. Unlike Origin, see that is sustainable. I'll tell you why. It's all made in America. Mm. Everything, all their stuff. You got denim jeans. You got geese, jujitsu stuff. You got boots, wallets. What a, uh, is there belts? They got a belt, yeah, belts, right? Belts, wallets, Men. beanies, sweatshirts, shorts. Oh, yeah. Pants, work And we pants. got more stuff coming. Oh, yeah. We got the hunt line coming, which the hunt line going to be versatile, too. Yeah. I was talking to Pete. I'm like, hey, you know, like the puffy jackets sure. that everyone wears? Every A lot of people wear. Sure. Not super puffy, but like a thin puff. Yeah, yeah, like when you go snowboarding. Yeah, case, yeah, you know. you got, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that kind of thing, when you go anywhere cold, people are wearing that all, all everywhere, yeah, right? Yeah. I said, hey, we, we, we need that. Well, so we're on that. Okay. So we're going to be able to have an American-made one yeah. because these people are like, oh, well, you know, we support the environment. We give some of our, um, some of our, are one percent of our profits to the environmental causes? Oh, cool. Meanwhile, you're supporting a freaking factory in China that's putting more crap into the air than your one percent could ever cover. Ever, yeah. And by the way, the people that are breathing that in is not just the people that live there; it's also worldwide and the slave labor that they have making these things. So we get it. You want to? You want to? Say how nice you are. We yeah. get it. You want to talk about your how, how positive you're doing for the environment? Yeah. You're. Not telling the truth. Yeah. So we're we're gonna we got we got you covered. Here. Origin USA. So there's an expression, BTN, right? BTN. 
stands for better than nothing, right? So people use that in a good way. Like, it's, right, it's yeah, better yeah. than nothing, it's better nothing, right? Okay. Yeah. You think workouts, freaking um, paying attention to your kids, uh, like all this stuff, you can use BTN, the mm. BTN method. Hey, yeah. it's better than nothing. It's like looking at the bright side yeah. of things, which is, it's not all bad. You see what I'm saying? That's what makes it a yeah. tricky thing. Yeah. But let's face it, you really want to go... What do you? How do you do it? The low res, the freaking black, real black and white, mm-hmm. right? BTN is not good. You want to do the best you can, straight up. Yeah. All right. So you start giving one percent to something that is a fifty percent detriment. <laughs> yeah. That's BTN. That's bad. Yeah, yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, it's better than nothing. True. Yeah. It's also forty nine percent bad. <laughs> <laughs> Freaking savages. <laughs> so, origin, USA, supply chain, taking care of. Mm-hmm. American made, taking care taking of. Taking care of. American economy being stimulated. Taking care of. Taking care of. Jobs good, being man. created. Yes, sir. Good jobs. Environment being saved. Good job. You talk to all of our people there making stuff, bro, they'll tell you all about it. All Smiling about it. the whole time. Yeah. Oh, man. Here to tell you. OriginUSA.com. Origin USA. com. That's where Go you get, get it. Go get yourself some. Also, Jocko is a store called Jocko Store. JockoStore.com is where you can get your discipline equals freedom, shirts, hats, hoodies, that kind of cool stuff, uh, stuff this is good. <laughs> it's when you want to represent, and we're representing on this path. You know what decentralized command is? Yes, sir. Okay, so sometimes, is there such a thing as too much decentralized command? Yes, sir. So, the there happens to be Warrior Kid Soap. We're down with that, right? Young Aiden out there, decentralized command, making stuff happen. Yeah. Guess what else he made? Hmm. Oh, yeah. Candles. <laughs> <laughs> so well, it's funny because in my house, I don't like candles. Forbidden. Right? Yeah, I don't like the smell of them. I don't like the more heat being produced in my house. I don't like a fire hazard up in here, no. right? Yeah. I don't like the the uh, the uh, the. Uh, What's that word? The atmosphere that it gives off, right? It's way it's too soft. soft. Yeah. Way right? Too weak, you want to yeah. make fire? We'll make a fire. <laughs> we're good with that. A candle? Yes, sir. No, we're not happening. But decentralized command, all of a sudden we got a Jocko candle and apparently we have an Echo candle too. Yes, sir. Yeah. So that's out there. And Echo soap too, by the way. <laughs> so, you know, hey man, do your thing. It sounds good. Yep. DTN. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Better In a good nothing. way this time. Um, but yeah, there's good stuff on there. Jocko store. Also on Jocko store, shirt the shirt locker. A lot of updates to that one. Mm. Upgrades. Upgrades. Update sounds like you know, just maybe just you know some bad things that are now not bad. I like the way you take your ideas and post them on the world. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny how you do that. I, I'm I'm, try, I'm trying to help over here. You see, what I'm saying yep. either way, upgrades on the shirt locker. Check those out. Shirt mm-hmm. Locker, if you don't know what that is, that's a new shirt every month. Subscription situation. Every month. They're all cool. They're they're a little bit more creative, you know? You know what Jack Daniel does? Oh yeah. Well no, he gets the he's he has enough shirts, right? Oh yeah. Which yeah. is pretty common yes, in America. You have enough shirts. Yes, sir. But he still wants to support. Yeah. And he's seen some shirts that have come out where he's been like, mm, that one would have been nice. Yeah. So he gift he gets them. And then he gifts them to the appropriate person. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense to me. Fully. JD. JD Making it happen. Uh, subscribe to the podcast. Speaking of subscriptions, wherever you subscribe to podcasts, we were just talking about podcast reviews. Yeah. It's cool. You want to leave a review, it's cool. What's interesting about the reviews is they're permanent. On the Apple reviews, they're permanent. So you can go yeah. back in time. Yeah. And you can go read early reviews about Echo Charles, man. The world was a ruthless place. <laughs> that is to- It was totally my fault. I, I, you know, I got, what do you call, I, I started on the wrong foot. What's that expression? Mm. You know, it got off on the wrong foot. This is why my first analogy, if I remember correctly, was like, you know, you got to balance the dichotomies or whatever mm. you were talking about back then. And I made the analogy of a gob of mercury on a trash can <laughs> lid. Oh, that's right. And bro, I'm just saying, imagine yeah. that, try to balance it. It's the same thing. It's a perfect analogy when you think about yeah. it. It's just kind of kind of out from fucking left field or whatever. And I get it. Yeah. And I took heat for it. Yeah, you Amen. did. You took some heavies in the early days. You're doing better now. <laughs> K Dog yes, was sir. on the other day. Yeah. He got his first taste of uh, social media, you know, heat. attacks. Yeah. Heat. Amen. K Dog. So, like uh, so, anyways, subscribe to this. Check out Jocko Unraveling. We're recording another one tomorrow. So, those should be up. Hitting some pretty interesting uh, topics with my brother, Daryl Cooper. Grounded podcast, The Warrior Kid podcast. And we have Jocko Underground. JockoUnderground.com. This is our alternative platform. In case 
we get attacked, mm. banned. Shadow banned. Shadow banned, banned which is apparently maybe. is a thing now, which has happened. Have you been shadow banned? I, I don't think I'm that oh. influential. Mm. And you never know, Let's bro. Face Maybe it. I need to take over your page and start posting all my controversial <laughs> stuff. Oh, yeah, so controversial, yes. Um, well, it is interesting. You know, it is interesting, but you wouldn't think that there'd be anything that they would look at me and go, yeah, we need to suppress this guy, but mm. hey, here we are literally being suppressed. Yeah. So we have to have a backup plan. We have to have a contingency plan in place, so that's why we have jockounderground.com if you want to help us build and maintain that. It costs eighteen dollars eight dollars and eighteen cents a month. That helps us build it and maintain it. We give you back another additional podcast. Do you need more podcasts? Probably not. Yeah. Maybe not. But maybe you like to chill. Maybe you like to hear about some alternative topics. And maybe you just want to support either way, we appreciate it. Also if you can't support us, we'll support you. If you can't afford eight dollars and eighteen cents a month, it's cool. Email assistance at jockounderground.com. We have a YouTube channel. It's true. <clears throat> which there's some really good videos on there. And most of the really good videos have that extra little component, that mm-hmm. extra thing that just makes them hit. Yes, sir. And that thing usually comes from me. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. assistant director. Yep. It's true. Yeah, yeah. I had to well when Carrie was in the hot seat, K Dog, I had to kind of <laughs> I had to go a little bit deep on that one. Yeah, yeah you've uh You've embraced that role mm-hmm. quite nicely. And, and it's we're weird. happy. We're you know happy what? with that. That's just the way it works. Yes, sir. So subscribe to the YouTube channel, check out the videos. Also you can you can see what Papa Jake looks like. Yep. And ninety nine years 90, young. Getting it. Ninety nine years old. Impressive. Pretty also awesome. Psychological Warfare. Mm-hmm. It's an album we did back in the day. Very useful album. Gets us past our moments of weakness. You ever think about and I'm not saying you, Jock, I'm saying to our people. Mm-hmm. You ever think about the day where you're about to slip or you're about to skip the workout? What if Jocko's like right there? Mm. Not yelling, not yelling, by the way. Just telling you, hey, like, hey, let's not skip this workout. In fact, here's some good reasons why you shouldn't skip this workout. See what I'm saying? And he was just telling you practical practical advice to not skip the workout. You'd probably do the workout. You'd probably do the workout. And in fact, you will do the workout. That's what psychological <laughs> warfare is, straight up. So you get Should that, I? you get that wherever you can get MP3s. It's a good one. Also, if you want to hang something awesome on your wall, go to flipsidecanvas.com, which is Dakota Myers' company, and he makes awesome stuff to hang on your wall. That's what it is, made in America. Got some books, obviously. First book, Luckiest Man in the World. Stories from the Life of Papa Jake by, by Jake Larson. It's a great book. We skimmed the surface today. Go check it out. Support the man himself. Also, Final Spin had that story come out, had that book come out, and check that one out if you wanna check that one out. Um, I would recommend you don't read it on a plane like J.P. Dinell if you're gonna get embarrassed when you're crying. Oh, yeah. I'm not saying you're gonna cry, but I'm saying it's an emotional book. It's, it's an emotional thing. roller coaster, sure. so check that out. There's some lessons in there. Leadership Strategy and Tactics Field Manual, The Code, The Evaluation, The Protocols, Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual, Way of the Warrior Kid, one, two, three, four. Hey, Christmas is coming. I don't care what you could you could be a billionaire. You can't get a kid a better gift than those four books. That is a fact. Yeah, There's correct. nothing you can get a kid f- that you know better than those books. Nothing. Nothing. There's nothing better. That's a bold statement. It is. And I just said it. Yeah. And I and I stand by it 100. percent There's nothing that could have better influence on a kid than those four books. When okay, do you remember the date that part one way of the where your kid came out? I, I want to say 2016. Okay, 16. So we got what five years in the in the bank. Yep. Maybe a little bit more than five years. My daughter was eight now. Still mm-hmm. demands I read every single night. Yep. Part one. We just finished it again, again. By the way, yeah. Just the best gift you can give for a kid. Yeah. So hook that up. Also, Mikey and the Dragons for the little little kids. Best little kids book that's ever been written. So that's what I've been he- hearing a lot <laughs> of. Uh, I, you know when f- dads mm. post and say they have a hard time making it through the book without tearing up. <laughs> that's where that's where we're at. Yeah, if you let it for sure. Yeah, that's kind of where we're at. Uh, about Face by Hackworth, and then Extreme Ownership, and the Dichotomy of Leadership. Also, we have Echelon Front, which is a leadership consultancy we 
solve problems through leadership. Leadership is the solution. If you need help with the leadership inside your organization, go to echelonfront.com. You can also find out about our live events there, whether it's the muster, whether it's field training exercises, EF Battlefield, you can check that out. Next muster is in Dallas, Texas, by the way, March 24th and 25th. We have online training program. You can't get good at jujitsu in one day. You can't get good at basketball in one day. You can't get good at guitar in one day. You can't get good at leadership in one day. You also can't get good at leadership from reading one book one time and thinking you got it. Now, it doesn't work like that. That's why we made the Extreme Ownership Academy. If you want to come, you want to ask questions, you want to interact with me, with Leif, with the rest of the EF team, come on there, extremeownership.com. And if you want to help service members, active and retired, their families, gold star families, check out Mark Lee's mom, Mama Lee. She's got a charity organization. And if you wanna donate or you wanna get involved, you wanna help veterans, go to americasmightywarriors.org. And if you want more of my over-emotional episodes or you need more of Echo's exasperating explorations, you can find us on the interwebs. On Twitter, on the gram, and on Facebook. Facebook. Echoes at Echo Charles. I am at Jocko Willink. And don't forget that you can also check out Story Time with Papa Jake on Instagram, on TikTok, TikTok, hell yeah. on YouTube. Great, great stuff to watch. And to all the service men and women, past, present, and future. Thank you, and especially to those of you that served in World War II. Whether you're here with us in this life or you've moved on to the next, we will not forget what you did for us and for mankind. And to our police, law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, Border Patrol, Secret Service, and all the first responders out there, thank you for your service, which keeps us safe here on the home front. And everyone else out there, this life is a gift. It's a gift, and I'll tell you something else, it is a fleeting gift. And every day that we have is one day closer to death and as Papa Jake said you can't turn back time you cannot turn back time and in the end even forever is too short so follow the example of this brave man that we heard from today Jake Larson and live every day to the utmost and you do that by going out there and getting after it Until next time, this is Echo and Jocko, out.